Wine. This is an interview with Nissan Sis, born in Davinsk, Poland. Latvia. Uh, Latvia. I'm Rona Arado. We're in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and the interview will be conducted in English. Today is September 13th, 1995. This is an interview with Nissan Cis, C-I-S-S, -S, born in Davinsk, Latvia. I'm Rona Arato, A-R-A-T-O. We're in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and the interview will be conducted in English. Would you please tell us your name, when you were born, and where you were born? My name is Nissan. Sis, I'm born in Dvinsk, Latvia. Dvinsk spells D-V-I-N-S-K. Latvia spells L-A-V-I-J-A. -A. Latvia. Uh, when were I, you born? I was born the 20th of April, 1925. Where the, is Dvinsk? Dvinsk is the, the, the second uh, large city from Latvia. The, the capital was Riga. And uh, Dvinsk is uh, uh, near, the, near the lake. It was a lake there. And the lake is called the Dvina. And uh, that's that's where the area where we lived. It was a a well populated city. I think it was about uh, forty five thousand Jewish people, and was uh, was a lot of synagogues. My 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 personal father was. Uh, he was a very active member. He was the cantor from a shul, which it was from uh, generations and generations very, very old. And he da uh, he davened there for the for the uh, for the uh, for all the services Friday night, Saturday, and all the holidays. He, he had a beautiful voice, uh, and it was a volunteer, a volunteer job. And uh, we were uh, seven children. We were six boys and one uh, one girl. And when we came in in the shoe, everybody admired us because my my father was very very res respected there, and uh, especially on Yom Kippur when he stayed by the by the own coitus and he said the prayers. So all the the sons, all the all the sons, he had he had it under the under the big talus and he covered us and he said the prayers. Everybody in the little shul was amazed, was appreciated and was so loved. It was so 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 and um, they give us such an honor, you know, and, and uh, that was the most precious time for us of the year. But we used to go all the time, on Friday and Saturday, we used to go to the shul. It was a, a neighborhood shul, wooden, old wooden uh, uh, chairs, very, very old, and the shamis was a nice old, old man. And uh, we, when we came in, he, they knew us because it's a small city, it wasn't a big city, but it, uh, we were regular there and they knew us like we were their own. And it was very, very, very touchy and very appreciated. The whole, the whole uh, neighborhood, you know, we came in, we were like a family, the, those people who belonged to that show. Then my... Uh, I, when I uh, when I started uh, to grow up, uh, and I was uh, bar mitzvah. After the bar mitzvah, I I started to work. What was 
the name of the shul? The shul, I cannot remember. I, it's impossible. I cannot remember. Did you have a rabbi? Yeah, was a, was a rabbi there. Do you remember his name? No. What was your father's name? Leib. And your mother? Itl. And your brothers and sisters? My, my oldest brother was Moishe, and the second was the sister, Rachel, and the third was uh, Laser, my brother, and the fourth was Yosef. Uh, 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 brother, and then I was Nissen, and then was Chaim, a brother, and then was Zalman. He was six brothers. And where did you go to school? We went to school. We went to the was a Jewish school, a Jewish. Uh, the, the, I think they call it the, the Chaim Nachem Bialik School, something like that. Uh, and it was a Jewish school, and we learned uh, Hebrew, we learned Yiddish, we learned the language from the from the country. What language did you speak at home? At home, we speak only Yiddish, only Yiddish. Yes, and uh, and uh, in the government uh, 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 places where you, where you have to go, you have to speak their language, Latvian. But we we speak both languages. Describe a Shabbat in your home. A Shabbat was uh, very, very touchy. It was out of the ordinary. We, uh, we, we, we lived in a small little house, a wooden house. And uh, my father was very religious. And the Shabbat was prepared like, like for King, King David. My father had, we had a, a table. Uh, a table with chairs, it was very, very old and very, very beautiful. It was red oak. And when my father was sitting on, the, on his uh, Mizrach side, when we had a beautiful chair covered with velvet. It was a beautiful chair. Nobody there was uh, thinking to sit down in this chair because the honor of our father. And on Friday night was... Uh, the mother was preparing Shabbat. Was she worked so hard? She started on Thursday, and she started. To, we weren't rich, but on Shabbat was Kiyat Hamelach, and she, she tried to make everything so beautiful, and everything was was done very nice. Then my father, he had uh, he had to uh, as, uh, to make the thing for for Shabbos uh, f uh, tea. So we had a shamavar, they call it, a Russian-style shamavar, a very big one. So we made uh, the, the shamavar for, for, for Shabbos, and then on uh, Shabbos, uh, 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 when we had to use it, it came in a, a boy, not a Jewish boy, and he had to add some coal in this. And uh, that's how we, my father started to think that we should have everything for Shabbos. And on Friday night, my father started to make Yiddish with his ta talented voices. And it was, it was very, very beautiful. It was very, very touchy. And we made the Yiddish, and we, then we, we cut the challah, we made the moitzi, and... and uh, we had always uh, we had our own wine, you know. My my, my mother used to make they they call it med, the the name of the wine from uh, raisins. She used to make it, you know, and uh, no, from uh, yeah, from raisins and something else. And we had everything. It was very specially for Shabbos. We had everything in the world. Our whole our whole week was a little bit different because it was a very very difficult uh, time and uh, meet a lot of children and the father was a shoemaker and he made a he made a living but uh, you know it was was never enough because the kids were growing up and and we needed more so I uh, I started I and my two brothers 
they walked before me, the elderly brothers, uh, 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 Laser and, uh, and, and Moshe. Uh, so what did they do? They walked, they walked by, by this friend, a brother, who's on the wall there, by this hill brother. He, was, he made the, he, he was, I don't know what you call it here, but he made the tops for the shoes, the leather parts for the shoes, for boots and for shoes. So they walked with, uh, by her brother, the Ostrinskis, they call it, Dina. Dina, this is the, one of the sisters from the, from the buses. Tell us about your mother. My mother, she was uh, a very, very nice lady. Her family was mostly living in, in Russia, in Leningrad. She had part of her family. And she worked so hard. And she tried to, to make everything from little things. She made very big things. Like we shouldn't be... Uh, uh, we shouldn't be feeling that we are not that that rich, that we cannot afford the things. She always made it us to feel that we got everything. She worked so hard. You know, for for, for Friday, for Friday she used to get up at three o'clock in the morning and go to the butcher and to buy the meat what she can afford and the best and that was fresh. Fresh, uh, fresh uh, killed uh, kosher meat, and there was no refrigeration. There was nothing there. The only thing is, what uh, you wanted to have fresh stuff, you had to go when they killed and they made ready and they made kosher everything, and that was where she started up three o'clock in the morning, and we had a, a little basement in the house. It was not a basement. It was was digged out. Uh, digged out the ground, it was from ground, was no no walls, was digged out and the steps was digged out like steps, but it was it was uh, clay. It, and uh, we we made the, from from the ground we made the, like shelves, you know, it, it chopped out from the ground, we made shelves and my mother used to cook and put, put everything there because it was nice and cool there and it was very nice cool. We didn't have no refrigeration or anything like that. But she wanted to save all the good things and uh, she put away uh, some food but she made it for Shabbos that should be for another few days. And in the in the fall she used to she used to make all kind of preserves, you know, like uh, like um, uh, desserts and pickles and and she used to make uh, corn beef she used to buy and preserve it in bar in a couple of bars small bars she used to she used to put them in to to make it ferment the way it should be you know with all the with all the seeds what you have to put in the the the, the preservatives you know and she was always uh, worried and always worked so hard. And in, especially in the winter time, when she washed the the clothes, was so hard. We didn't have uh, we have wa we had water, but we didn't have uh, 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 um, we didn't have no water going down. Okay. Where did you get your water? Well, water was coming in in the house, but nothing go down. We had to we had to take out was a pail under the sink, and when uh, you washed your face or used the water and it went in the pail, and then you had to, to take it outside and spill it out. And uh, then we, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, the rest of the week, was, was very, very difficult for the mother because she, she used to work so hard and, and try to prepare and make uh, the food and everything. We had a, an oven. Uh, was very very big, like in a like in a baker shop, and she used to bake your own your own bread for your own challahs for your own and she used to put in a she used to put in a a clay a clay jar, a big one, a very big one with a small head, and she made coffee just for coffee. This we had uh, water boiling in the samovar. 
for tea, but this was coffee, and she used to put it in, in the in the oven, and that used to stay 24 hours. And on Shabbos, uh, uh, Shabbos for breakfast, after, after the shoe, after the shoe, uh, we come and she took out the 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 the, the color the lac, and uh, she took out that coffee, and it smelled so beautiful. And the atmosphere was so nice because she prepared so much things. She used to bake her own, her own strudel, her own uh, uh, purim. She used to make her own home and uh, and everything. And it was really, really, really beautiful. How was the oven fueled? With, uh, the oven was fueled with wood. But uh, the wood, uh, we didn't have a place where to keep it. And it was outside. And it was. Uh, most of the time was wet and it didn't burn good. So we we took in in the house. We put somewhere in a corner there by the place where we go down the basement and to to keep it dry, especially for for uh, Shabbos when she used for the oven. Uh, a whole week we had a a thing uh, what uh, uh, went on on uh, napta gas. A napta gas, they call it kerosene, and we had a little, a little uh, thing like that. And uh, for for the morning, we had to we were little kids. We go to school. She used to make uh, the coffee and this. She used to make on that, you know. And uh, uh, she always uh, tried to make the, the lunches for for the sh uh, school for us. She had so much work to do to prepare for seven kids, you know. And when, when, yeah, uh, I wanted to say something before. When I, when she used to wash the clothes, and and this was the hardest day for her of of the week of the, I would say of the life, especially in the winter time, because when she washed the clothes, she used to put on the on the on the on the on the stove on top of the stove. She used to put a big pot, a big pot, a black pot. Black pot. Uh, I forgot the name of the material. Uh, steel pot, and inside was white, completely white. Uh, the facing inside was beautiful. Uh, and she used to boil all the, all the clothes. She used to boil it for so a certain time, and then after she boiled it, she took it out and she used to go to the lake, and rinse it. And she used to go to, we used to go and help her. And she used How to go far was the lake? The lake was about, uh, I would say, uh, a couple of miles. How did you get there? We walked. We walked. It was a, uh, we lived, uh, it was a, uh, the highway was uh, very high. And we lived below the highway from this side. And from the other side of the highway was the, the lake. And this lake, they called it Vina. And the, this lake was very long. She went into the, Baltic Sea in Riga, that lake, and in Baltic Sea because it was a very big lake. It, it looked like the weight of the Lake Ontario, you know, or something like that. And uh, it was very, very difficult and very hard for the mother. But the nicest thing was when every Thursday my father used to take all the six sons. We used to go in the, in the, in the in the in the in the uh, to make uh, the, what do you call it, the bat. Yeah, we didn't have nothing of this, we didn't have nothing of this in the house, no hot water, nothing, we had to take a bath, but we went in a special place. We had to buy tickets and had to go there. And uh, my father, when he went in, in this steam bath, they call it, okay? But it's very, very old fashioned, it was very, very beautiful, very old. The, 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 the the chairs we were sitting, the benches, was uh, really, really old wood. And the first thing my father used to do, he used to come in the steam bath, and was a chimney there. He used to take a bucket of water and pour it in, in the chimney, and then all the steam came out because there was, there was uh, uh, a hot coal all the time, was red coal, and we should get nice and clean and he used to work so hard to wash us when we were clean. And later on, the older brother, he used to help washing the, uh, the second one, the second, the third one, and that's how, how we managed to live the very, very hard life.
what was your describe your house? What was the house? The house was, was the house was a wooden house. Uh, like a farmhouse, okay? But a wooden house, a very simple house, and it had only two rooms. In the and two rooms and the, the small area where the oven was. In the, in the in the night my father had a bedroom with my mother and the sister lived had a had a bed beside there. And all the six brothers we had in the other room, in the daytime, in the daytime was a dining room with a table. And in the night we put out the mattresses. The mattresses was made from the sex, from the sugar, because it was thick and strong. My mother made this, the mattresses and we pu put out the mattresses and we, we, on the floor. And that's how that was our bedroom. And in the morning, when we had to get up and go to school, was a breakfast, a dining room. The table was set, and the things was on the table and everything. You never knew that six boys lived and slept in this room during the time it was needed. What time did you get up? Well, we get up. Uh, the school started at nine o'clock. And um, we got up at seven. And uh, when I went to school, was a Jewish factory on the way where I was, where they made all the corned beef and all the, the salami, the kosher stuff. It was a very, very beautiful place. The whole place was uh, from white tiles. And the smell, when you pass by that store, it was unbelievable. It, it got you right away, you know, the, the feeling of a good, good food. So I asked my mother, and she always gave me 25 groschen. And I, I, I took a piece of bread, and I went in, the, in that place, and I bought uh, a little bit salami, something, to enjoy it a little bit. Uh, the good stuff, and it was very, very beautiful. And then, uh, we, when I went to school, you know, I was, uh, I was, I was very relaxed already because I know I have my lunch. I'm not going to be hungry, and I, 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 I concentrating on the, on my learning. I, I didn't go far. I went. I think it was seven, seventh grade. You know, because I, I had to stop because I had to go and and uh, try to, to make something easier for my father to, for keeping up the, the uh, things, what we need for the, for, for the house and for the kids. And Describe your clothing. How were you dressed? We were dressed very simple and very beautiful. My, my sister, she, she went in a school. She had to have a uniform. She had a blue blue uniform, a, a, beaut a blue dress, and uh, with, uh, with uh, straps, you know, like, a, and, and, uh, and a white blouse, you know, and when the boys, they, they were wearing whatever you, you, you had, whatever you were, it was nothing special, as long as you were reasonable clean, you know, were very... What was the Jewish community like in Dvinsk? What organizations were there and well the the Jewish community was very very active under the circumstances what they could uh, they could serve you understand because it was was a lot of, uh, was very few very few wealthy people what they helped out one I know wasn't uh, far from us living uh, uh, was his name uh, Kagan? I still remember, and he had a, a brewery from beer. That was the only brewery in the city, you know. And in the summertime, the people used to go by there on the little chairs and tables who could afford it and sit down and uh, drink a beer straight from the 
from the factory. They, put, they come out with the barrels, you know, and, and, and they served the people the, the thing. And it was, um, he did a lot of things for the Jewish community. They did, uh, they give, uh, they helped so much, you know, to people with, uh, with uh, learning and with, uh, with equipment, what we need, you know. They tried uh, to to learn most most families. They tried when you had boys to learn, like in a cheder, you know. But it wasn't like here. You went in a cheder. It was only was a teacher, and he had about seven or eight students. And uh, they tried to teach him the Jewish way of uh, of life, the, the Jewish uh, things. What were relations like between the Jews? and non-Jews in Vince? Uh, the relations between the Jewish and non-Jews wasn't very, very good. It was very um, anti-Semitic uh, feelings, very, very, very much, because they, they always, uh, they always uh, pointed, you know, when a Jewish boy, you know, and he was, uh, going with, with uh, payers and things like that, you know, and dressed like a Jew, or, or they passed by in a, by a synagogue and they saw the, the people with the talisim, you know, outside and on the holidays, you know, and in the summertime when it's hot, and this, this always was uh, pointed and saying uh, bad words, you know. It was very, the, the, the people there was very, very, uh, not friendly to the Jewish community. Did did you wear pays? Pardon? Did you wear pays? Pays? No, 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 no. no. I, my father was religious. We were religious, but uh, no, we didn't find that orthodox. But it was religious. Everything was kosher. Everything was kept in the house. Do you, do you recall any anti-Semitic incidents that affected you? Personally, well, uh, I was uh, when I was a kid. I was once on the on a, on a soccer game, on a soccer game, and it came uh, a Jewish uh, a Jewish uh, team, and I forgot uh, what uh, they were called, and they uh, and they played the soccer. That was on a Saturday wasn't far from our house was the, the stadium and we went to see that and, and uh, Hagiba I think was the name from the Jewish group the Jewish team Hagiba I think and uh, they it happened the day one you know at that, that time when I was there and the, 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 the they started to 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 be uh, aggressive you know, against uh, the, uh, the Jewish people because it was a Jewish uh, team. You know, but uh, in in average, you know, they uh, it was very very hard. It was was wasn't wasn't a democratic uh, country. They, they you know that they, whoever was there, they sh they they should know that he has that same right as everybody. A Jewish people, they always was a third class citizen in this country. Were there restrictions on your movements? It was. Uh, it wasn't restrictions on the movement, but it was. It was. Uh, wasn't easy when they you read out the name and they know that you, you had to go to the government places and achieve some kind of documents or some kind of things. You know, it, it, it was. It wasn't easy. Tape two, Nissan Cease. Tell me about your brothers and your sisters. Well, I had only one sister, and we were six brothers. And the best time of our life was on a Saturday, after my mother worked so hard 
to make Shabbos. And she made a chum, and she made the, f the food, and she made everything so proudly and so tactful and so, uh, so uh, she, all the efforts what she, uh, she giving in this, it showed when we enjoyed the beautiful Shabbos meal. And uh, after the meal, we were already full, everything was so nice. And then me, this, the boys, we went out to play, to play outside, football or something like that, With soccer, you know, we played. And uh, the sister went to, to visit her girlfriend. And the father and the mother said, now we need a rest. And we had uh, outside on the, on the windows, we had those uh, louvers, what do you call it? Louvers, where you close the, the sun shouldn't come in? Blinds. Not blinds, outside. Oh, outside, shutters. Out shutters. We had shutters and they, they, they asked us to close the shutters. It should be nice and cool. And they, they got a nap for two, three hours, whatever. And we went, we went to the park and we played soccer and we played all kind of other activities because we were enjoying it and appreciated the hard work from our parents and it was really really a, a touchy touchy moments because we, we knew that we left our parents to have a nice sleep after so hard work and my father used to work so hard to to make uh, and meet and and his responsibility he was well known and he was well liked in the shul and at, at his job what he did how did you conclude shabbat at the end of the day okay in the end of the day we were in the shul for the prayers for the evening prayers and then we came we came home all together with my father and then my father made avdola and it was very beautiful, with his beautiful voice, he made of doll and everything, and everybody stand around. You know, my, my sister was beside the mother, and the, the brothers was beside the father. It was really, really beautiful. And uh, we sing some kind of a Hebrew, Hebrew songs, you know, and uh, to continue in a, in a happy, joyful evening, to celebrate the beautiful Shabbos, which we were waiting a whole week for it. Tell, tell us about your father's work. What did he do? He was My father was a shoemaker. He fixed shoes and he made new ones. The most specialized was in his, uh, his uh, trade was the uh, uh, boots the high boots for the officers for the police for the police and for the officers from the military only for the officers because it was a very special style of it was this was dedicated to that to that thing and and uh, he used to make it to measure you know like uh, it was uh, completely very start from the from 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 nothing to the, the he used to have his own forms made from wood. The forms from the boot, he used to have it made from wood. The, the form from the foot, you know, and the sizes from, from so, the, all kinds of sizes to fit the customers. Where did he work? He had a little, a little place, he rented a little place on a, on a street not far from us. It was a... a like going down in, in a, not on the upper floor, but in the basement floor, like because it was cheaper and it was affordable, and that's where he was working. And what were his relations like with the non-Jewish customers? Well, he, he was very friendly. You know, he was very friendly. You know, he he tried not to to talk about anything, you know, because uh, when you start to talk about anything, you start disagreeing and things, you know. But he had a good reputation, a very good reputation. He had customers coming from very far, where it was other shoemakers they used to come to him, you know. So after your bar mitzvah, what happened? This, oh, first, describe your bar mitzvah. 
Yeah. Well, my mitzvah was uh, very simple, was in that shul where my father was uh, uh, conducting his services voluntarily without any anything that he got for it. Just he was happy to do it, you know. And uh, was uh, was on a Shabbos, and they uh, called me up to the Torah reading and everything. And all the neighbors and all the, the members, they brought uh, little treats, what they made as their own at home. And they brought it. Uh, it's not like uh, here, you order a meal, you sit down and uh, have a full course meal and everything. They brought the uh, lecker and, and sponge cake and cookies and, uh, and, uh, and drinks, you know. And, uh, it was very, very nice. It wasn't a huge place, but uh, wherever anybody could sit down, was was served a table. One table was served, and the rest, uh, all the people sit down in the places where they used to pray, because it wasn't special dining room, or, I mean special hall, where they uh, celebrate the things. You know. Can you describe the, the synagogue? The synagogue was very, very, very beautiful. It was very old, you know. When you come in, you come in at... Uh, had the, the, the feeling that is thousands of years was this created, you know. It was really, really, really touchy. The 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 the, the, the onkoides and the the, the 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 cover and everything. I forgot what you call that. And uh, it was really, really. It was donated by many, many people who could afford it because that was a. Uh, very artistic and very special design for it. It was really beautiful. What was the year in Kodesh made of? Pardon? Describe the year in Kodesh. What was it uh, made of? It's made of, well, uh, the, the, the cover was uh, from velvet, you know, like the, the what do call it, the, the, was velvet and the beautiful gold color uh, words uh, put in there. It was everything done by hand and everything was with the uh, fringes on the bottom, gold color gold color, beautiful, and uh, the, the Onkodesh was made for very shiny, dark red wood. It was very, with uh, round pillars, pillars they call it, pillars? 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 Pillars, yeah, round pillars, it was, it was really beautiful. And when they opened the Onkodesh, the, 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 the curtain was just touching the pillars, it was really, really beautiful, you know. How many people did the synagogue hold? How big was it? It was uh, maybe about uh, 150. It wasn't big. Where, where were the women? The women was, uh, was covered uh, a, a space beside, inside. Was all covered, on one floor? Uh, all on one floor, yeah, yeah. It was covered, a small place. There for women with, uh, with curtains, with solid curtains, not to see through. With the uh, brass, brass, iron, uh, uh, bars, you know, to hang up the curtains was brass, was so beautiful. Brass, very, very clean, nice brass, shiny brass. It was uh, like old, old, old stuff. It was really, really beautiful. And what do you remember about holidays? What's your favorite memory of a holiday at the show? Well, the holiday, they, they, they started to call up uh, people who are talented, who spoke, they had speeches and they spoke about the situation, uh, what we knew around the world, you know, like the, 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 the was uh, people who are more uh, involved with the general public, you understand, and they knew more about the situation, about the Jewish people around the world and what's happening in Israel. Uh, that time, that time, with the alias, with the, with the, with the illegal, uh, with the illegal uh, uh, alias who people went, some kids uh, from my neighbors, they went, you know, they, that, at that time they went to Israel, a few, you know. And when was that? You? That was in 19, uh, 1937 or something like that. Did you have people coming from the outside to speak to you, from Palestine? Uh, well, it was... Uh, uh, one time, what I remember, was coming the cantor Moise Kusevitsky for a concert. And that was in a very big shul. Our shul was a neighborhood small shul. And that shul was a very, very big, I would say, 
the size of the holy blossom. And it was very, very big at the, in a, in a town like this. About how many people would it hold? Could you hold about 500 people, maybe? Very big, nice. And it was, uh, it was um, uh, from, uh, from a solid stone, gray, light gray stone, very, very beautiful design, you know. And I remember at that time when uh, Moise Kusevitsky came from America to give a concert, it was really, and my father, did everything in the world to get tickets that you should all go in here that it was a big big luxury because he knew far advance that uh, he's coming you know he got the ticket yes and we all went to what do you remember uh, about that concert it was it was really 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 amazing you know i uh, you know what i'll tell you that after that i i we went and we bought records and that back home was a record player wasn't like here you know <laughs> it was a record player you had to you had to divide it with the with, with, uh, with the hand it was no electricity and we heard moise kusevitsky's uh, 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 voice it was really really beautiful really appreciated it was really touching what other kind of news were you getting from outside? From oh, outside, we used, to, we used to be newspapers. Yeah, it used to be. It was a Jewish newspaper. It used to be Jew, uh, newspapers. We knew the, mostly we had a radio. If you had a good radio, you were a rich man. You understand? Because a radio, a good radio, we had a good radio. And we heard news from everything, you know. And then, and then the brothers, uh, when they got older, you know, they, they tried to to accumulate some records, uh, you know, to hear those Jewish uh, songs, the Jewish the beautiful opera singers and everything. What songs do you remember? What are the songs you used to listen to? Well, uh, mostly everything. What what the old, the old, the old. Uh, fashion stuff. Remember any of the names? Ayi de and and um, uh, 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 Mazel Tov was a beautiful uh, wedding song, you know, and then was uh, 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 f quite a, quite a few, you know, it was really really nice. It was very very ap appreciated, you know, when we, we put down the records and to listen to that, you know, very appreciate to, to who got it for us, you know, it was really, really something, because that time there was no television, even a radio, a good radio, you, you couldn't uh, afford, you know, because the standard of living was very, very, very low, and especially in the winter time was, <coughs> so cold, you know, and sometimes we, the, 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 the blizzard was so, so strong, you know. It wasn't there like, a, like here they come and, uh, and they clean the streets. You could walk on the sidewalk by us. The whole winter they never cleaned the snow on the sidewalk. You know, they, they used to throw coal from the furnace. They used to throw coal on the sidewalk to be able to walk, not to fall. And they, they piled up so high. And then in the springtime, the the warm weather started to evaporate this, but it, it was a very, very hard life. How did you keep warm in the winter? In the winter we had uh, one oven, where, uh, first of all, the, on Shabbos was the, the warmest the evening what we had, because the, mom, the mother had the, the oven going. And then it was uh, one that was in the site of our place where we had the dining room where we boys used to sleep. And the parents' room was an uh, oven uh, from tiles, uh, and they call a nice, a tall one that was right up to the ceiling there. You know. And uh, they used to put in some, uh, sometimes used to use, uh, they call it torf. Of it's like like pressed pressed stuff what they find in the in the in the in the woods and it's like like the size of a brick you know it's not coal but it's some some kind of wooden stuff that uh, we put in this and that kept very very long and very warm you know we used to buy this stuff for where were the bathrooms the bathrooms that was uh, unspeakable 
unbearable and unspeakable. That was outside. We had to go, if somebody had to go in the washroom, we had to go outside. I would say about 200 feet and you had to go outside from the from the warm from the warm uh, uh, bed whatever how warm it was to go outside you know you had to get rest and, and be outside it was very very uncomfortable and very very miserable especially, especially in the winter time is there anything else that you recall from the time before the war from your life that you would like to Wow, well, my uh, <coughs> we used to go. Uh, my father had uh, a few brothers. We used to go visiting, you know, and they used to come visiting to us. And we used to go visiting to them. Where know. were they? Where did they live? They they lived the same in Dinsk, yeah. And uh, we we been we were in, in contact as much as we as we could, you know. Did you ever get together for holidays? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We used to go together. Sometimes, sometimes in their place, and sometimes they come to a us. A seder. Yes, yes. What yes. was the seder like? The seder was very, very, very beautiful. If you would, if you would have uh, at that time a, a movie camera or something, it would, would be very beautiful to see it. It's like the really, really old times and. Uh, we never, we never, we never finished that till till three in the morning. It was done, you know, because we started late. Really, we started late, and uh, because the main ceremonies was at midnight. I used to and say that was very, very late, almost all night. What time did you start? Well, we started uh, around uh, nine o'clock, but. Uh, uh, this was only talking and talking about the the the, the whole uh, they call it the uh, agoda. You know, they talk, explain every word what's written in the agoda, and uh, and they, that you should understand what's all about. You know, and uh, it was really really pleasant. So, when did life begin to change? Uh, life for us, you mean for the Jew. For us, especially for us, was uh, when we got a little bit older, you know. We got a little bit older, and my my sister she finished uh, she finished school and she got a, a job as a as a just before before the war broke out, about four or five months. She had a she got a job. We were so happy for her. She was a sales lady in a ladies' lingerie store, and that was on the main. The main street and the main street where the the railroad station was, it called the Rigas Rigas Yelas in Latvian Rigas uh, the Riga Gas. Is that the street? The street name, yes, Rigas Yelas in Latvian. Yela is a street. Rigas Yelas, and uh, she was very happy. It was a very respectable. It's like. Uh, like a uh, uh, young street, you go in, in. It's not even not, not young street. It wasn't that nice as there it was. Re really, like you go in a, in a beautiful city, in a, you know, in the main main street. You go in Ottawa in the main main, main uh, sections there. <coughs> and she was very happy, and she was uh, she was supposed to get married, you know, not. If the world wouldn't work out, she would get married. And your brothers, what were they doing? They 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 were working. They were working. Where were they working? As I said they were working it in a in a my landsman. The the picture is there. And you were working at this time? Yeah, I was working at a tailor shop. Was two brothers. Was two brothers, and a mother. And these two brothers, uh, they were very, very nice to me. But what was it? When you went in, in a tailor shop, to learn how to work there, to teach you from nothing, to make you a tailor, you had to do all kind jobs. You had to do the worst things that you can expect. Because uh, they didn't pay you, 
and you didn't pay them for what uh, for about a year they just for teaching this and those two brothers they had a, a mother and she was ill and she was uh, paralyzed and many many times I had to go inside and and attend the, what I had to do to make everything right. It wasn't pleasant, but I had to do it, and I was I was happy, and I didn't say nothing because they were very good to me. They teach me, and that was very very nice. After after six months, I was uh, I would say graduated from them, and then that they. they they realized that I'm so good, they hired. I, I knew for six months when I was working, I knew as much somebody can work three years, because I was very, 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 very catchy. I catched everything so fast. So they hired another boy, and I was already on top. You know, and I, then it's, they started to pay me already. And it was very, very nice, very beautiful. As a matter of fact, when <coughs> The last part before before we got free, I was with one of the brothers marching out from the concentration camp, and he was he was behind me, and uh, he was uh, he he couldn't walk anymore. We were walking for for three weeks, nights and days, and he fell down, and and they. The the guards, the SS guards, they put the, the, the dog on him and they rip, he, they ripped out his neck, and that was one of my bosses. I was really really shocked to see that. I was really 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 upset and really really uh, touchy. So, <coughs> when did you begin to feel problems? When did life begin to change in terms of the war? The, the war? Well, it was uh, around, uh, around, around uh, Pesach time. What year? We, we, it's 1941. We, we, we hear that the, Russia, the Germans already are in Poland, here in Poland, there, and we're not far from that, you know. And in a few months, we hear all the news, and the, 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 the that they going in here and they going in there. We heard everything, you know, and then they, a couple of months later, they were close to our f uh, doorstep. Did you have any knowledge before 1941? And what did you know about what was happening to the Jews outside of Latvia? No, we didn't know. You didn't know? No, no. Had anyone come into, your t into Devinsk from other places? Well, refugees or anything? No, we didn't come refugees. We used to come people from other countries uh, to to visit relatives. You know, like uh, like uh, I had an uncle in the states. You know, he used to send uh, he used to send uh, parcels for Passover, special special for Pesach. He used to say uh, he send clothes for us, and he used to send uh, money for Pesach to make Pesach. He shouldn't be short in anything. He used to get a. Uh, couple hundred dollars, you know, that was a fortune of money that time. And everything was very, very joyful, very beautiful. My father's brother was living in the States, but when I, when I got free, I tried to find it. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find it. It's a long time. He wasn't living. He wasn't alive, but I didn't know the kids. Well, he had kids. He didn't have kids. I don't know. So in 1941, after Pesach, yes. what, what happened? Well, it started. It started uh, already uh, hearing that the, the Germans are occupying this, and the Germans are occupying this, this, this place in Poland, uh, around, you know, and that they're coming closer to, to, to take to 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 take out their, take everything, whatever, wherever the aggressive aggressive are, wherever they they go for it, they. Uh, they were going so fast, you know, that they, uh, in, in a couple of months, they were close, uh, close to us. And then we felt about uh, three days, <coughs> three days before 
before they come into Astavaranda on the side of the other side of the river, you know. And three days later they before they before they came in the before they came in the Germans, the Latvians started to, to kill Jewish people in the street. Uh, yeah, uh, my neighbor was a boy. He went to, to the bakery to get a bread or something. He never came back. They found they found him dead. And the, uh, the, the Latvians they put on they put on the the swastikas on the armbands. Uh, they put on the, the swastikas and the, uh, and they start to go on and, and to to beat up Jewish people and kill some of them. Is this the first time you'd had this kind of trouble with the Latvians? He, he, that was well. They 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 felt like that they are not they are Germans. That they are not Latvians. That 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 their victory came. You know, when the Germans came in, they were waiting for it. Wait. They took him in with open arms. The Germans. Were there any restrictions or any restrictive laws in place at that time? Well, at the, well, at that time it was only short. About three days later, they they came in across the river and they came in to us, and then they started. Uh, uh, we, as I say, we ran uh, we ran away. We wanted to run away. We went to the train station and we got in on a on a train on a uh, it's not a passenger train, but a I uh, call it uh, the what if you carry all kind uh, freight freight trains yes and and we went on the on the train to and they said that the train will take us to the border near the Russian border so it uh, wasn't far I don't know maybe a hundred kilo hundred fifty kilometers or something like that and in the end was that. Uh, the guy who uh, was in charge of the locomotive, he, he drove us off about eight or ten miles. He drove us off from 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 the city, and uh, he uh, he left a, he, the train stopped, and we didn't know what it was. But the the reason was that uh, he put on fire the locomotive, and he, he ran away. And then uh, we were sitting there for three four hours, and a couple. Of uh, and we started to hear the names and the voices of German language, you know. So we, they said, they said that uh, the, 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 in in here is the verfluchte Juden. They said in German, you know, and it was very very. We saw that this is the end of us, and they uh, they took us out and they put us in the on the ground. They start to count and this and that, and then. And the city was burning from the war. Which city? Dvinsk, yes, it was burning, it was destroyed, almost everything. How many people were on the train? And the train was a couple of thousand people. And they took them all out? Yes, they put them all out and they put them on the, on the field there and they started to guard it and then they, <coughs> they took away the, the younger ones, my three brothers, they took away their time. Which brothers? Moishe, Moishe, Laser, and Shmuel. They took away, and they um, they uh, assembled them at the on a place where they used to make the the parades for the for the uh, holidays. You know, like like the Civic Square or something like that. You know, and they and they put him there, and then they took him. Uh, uh, away from there, and we didn't know where they put him. We're just going to pause and continue on the next time. Okay. Tape 3, Nissan Cease. September 13th, 1995. Please continue. You were telling us about what happened after you were taken off the train. Okay. We want to, uh, to continue from that, uh, that uh, horror we went through. 
So when they took away my brothers and they, they, they assembled all the people there on the big, uh, big uh, um, field, and uh, us, to us, they said to the rest of the people, they said to go in the city, to go in the city. The city was burning. We didn't know where to go, nothing. So we found one building was burned down already, but the basement was okay. And uh, so we went, uh, uh, we went down to the basement. It was me and my sister and my uh, uh, Rochel and my brother uh, Zalman and Chaim and me, Nissan, and uh, my father. And uh, we went down there and we stayed a couple of days and uh, we didn't have what to eat. And I, I, we, we, it was a, a basement, a, a burned-down building. Where was uh, your mother? The, the mother was with us. Oh, she was with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, the mother was, and then the sister and the two brothers, and the three older brothers, they took them away, and they, they said they, they killed them right away. They took them out of the city and they killed them. Who, who told you this? What? How did you find out that they'd been killed? You found out because there was uh, people, not Jewish people, who said they saw the, they saw what, what what they did, yes, and then uh, then they start to take us. Uh, uh, they put up uh, signs and they went around and they're speaking on loudspeakers with with uh, propaganda things that uh, we should all uh, uh, come to a place where they, they uh, can get us all the Jewish people who remain in the city, they should all come out on the, on the, on the field, on the same uh, field, and the same uh, where they, uh, they took away the, the young people first. And, <clears throat> and we had to uh, uh, come all together, till they got us all together, we went in, uh, they took us, uh, they said they're going to take us away, they took us to a place where it was the was a very, very old uh, place from the army. It was a place for the cavalry. From the, from the, they kept the army horses there. And it was uh, out of the city, uh, you know, about, uh, maybe about uh, 10 kilometers away. And it was, uh, uh, was lots of places. There was underground, what, what, all the ammunition what they had was a, a very, very historical place because they said that if they get Dvinsk, you know, if they get Dvinsk uh, surrendered, the military, they, they gonna, they gonna go farther without any problems because Dvinsk was counted as a strategic military, old, old, uh, strong stronghold, you know. So they, uh, then they, uh, they made uh, where the barracks was from the horses there, the, the big, big blocks of uh, buildings from the horses, the stables, okay, and they, and they, they made uh, the ghetto there. They made the ghetto there and they brought us all in there. They made uh, where, the, where the horses were standing, they made the rolls of uh, of uh, I don't know how they call it uh, uh, to lie people on it. How do you call it? Uh, uh, like platforms. Platforms. Okay, three three floors high. They made platforms. One, two, three, and uh, two people to to lie on that uh, from the floor. I would say about uh, two feet from the floor and up uh, three three rolls high, and they put the people in there, you know, all the people, thousands of them was there. Who was Many. guarding you? The, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, this compound was uh, fenced around. It wasn't an open compound because this compound is very, very old from the old, old, uh, old Russian, old, old uh, military things. It's very, very, very strong compound there. And was a fence, a, a stone fence. Uh, maybe uh, two feet thick, and I don't know, was very high. 
en uh, de, uh, de, en dan was aan de was aan de main gate uh, en die was uh, de zes uh, de boot daar en de zes uh, daar we never we never they brought people there to check at the trucks and uh, people went out they they, they checked it there so they uh, they put us in the place there and we were uh, together with uh, my mother and my sister and the two brothers we were in a and the one place we didn't have much much clothes, they didn't give you nothing. Whatever we had with us, we had to put underneath as a, as a mattress or a, a jacket or whatever, or, or something to cover us. And, uh, and then they called out uh, to go, um, the, the specialists, what they wanted uh, for work. So they had, they come in in the big hall, in the big uh, place where the bark is, and they called on a microphone, who is a tailor, who is a, who is a, a shoemaker, who is a, a jewelry repairman, or who is a, a photographer, or who is something else, you know. And they called out, and people, uh, people lift up the arm, and they, uh, and they, called them over and they spoke to them and they told them other then they uh, uh, they put him some people came what uh, all the Germans uh, in the German uh, uh, officers they came and whatever they needed help and to work around the city whatever for them for them or for the city work or for the doing build uh, clean up the, the mess there and everything so they uh, come in there and they said they want 50 people or 100 people, they want uh, uh, five tailors and two shoemakers and this, this compound and this compound. And they took uh, uh, people and we went to work, and, uh, but we went, we went with a guard, the ass assessment with a, with a machine gun, it was uh, guarding us, we never went by ourselves. So who went? Where did you go? Where did you work? We went uh, in the city where we had, uh, they had a place where, where uh, where they, they they took us there and, uh, and we worked and we come. Who worked? Back. You had well. I, I worked. My my father was working. That that time I was only uh, me and my father was working. That time my mother, my sister, and the two little brothers was in the in the compound there. And one day they made a, an appeal. They start to to uh, they call it an appeal. They call it a uh, counting counting uh, of the of the people you know they start to count the people and then they uh, they they made uh, they made uh, uh, two lines left and right so when they made the two lines left and right we we start we started to think this is no good already so they uh, made left and right so for for left left they put the people who they needed, and for the right, who people they want to, they want to uh, destroy. So near us, where we were standing, there was a, a a couple standing, a husband and a wife, and uh, that they said to the husband, they said uh, to to go to the right, to the left. And she remained in the right. And uh, when uh, he, they took, uh, they told him to go to the right. Uh, she started to scream, and she started to yell and started to cry. And she was pregnant, maybe seven, eight months pregnant. And she started to 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 rip her hair and emotion. She was so emotional. She was so it was unbelievable. They. Uh, and then they, she started uh, to run to the husband, no matter what. So the assessment took me the big machine gun, with the, 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 the heavy machine gun they had me the round, the round uh, bullet, uh, the round uh, casing. Uh, there was, I don't know, 120 bullets, whatever, I don't know how many there. And with the heavy thing, it gave her a bang in the stomach and, and she lost the baby right on the spot there. It was so, so unbelievable, was so, so, so touchy, so, so, so scary, and so unbelievable. And uh, then they, they took her away because she was, uh, she was almost like that, you know. 
and the husband had to stay there. And then uh, we, we, me, my father, they, they called out then, and they, we had to go to the left side too. And and my father and my uh, and my mother and my sister, my two brothers, they remained there. And uh, we went to work. And we went to work. We come uh, after the day. We come back in the in the ghetto. We didn't stay there. We came here and when we came back, we we saw it was uh, usually you hear noises, people, you know, crying, talking, uh, people walking in the ghetto. They taking people walking around, cleaning up, you know, the streets, whatever, you know, the. Uh, the compounds, people going here, mit, they used to carry the carriages, you know, like 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 fiddler on the roof, you know, with the, that kind of carriages, you know. They used to carry our own stuff from one block to the other. And they, uh, and they uh, started to to make make uh, the people work, you know, and then they started uh, to to do all kind of things, but we saw when we came back it was was so unusual. It was uh, unbelievable this because we saw right away that something is wrong. It's too quiet in there, and we came into the gates. We saw we saw pieces of bodies from children, a head, an arm, a half a hip, a half a this. What they did, they they they, they liquidated the ghetto at that time, you know. And they took everybody away, and they um, they had a. Uh, we, we found out later that it was a summer resort. They call it Pogulanka. That was a summer resort, and they uh, they made a grave there. They opened a grave. I would say about uh, 500 feet by 100 feet, and they when they killed when they killed the people. They took him over there, and they they, un they undressed him, and they brought him on trucks, and they and they unloaded them, and they put him beside the the grave, and they, and they killed him there, and they fell, and they fell in inside. Some some were alive, some were far, some was uh, some was dead right away, some was still alive. And in the end of the their mission, they put the, the white stuff. They call it kalch. The burning stuff and they shouldn't smell, and the people were still living, lying there. Some of them was lying there dead, already from the first shot. And some, you understand, when they put that, so some people it gets right away. Some, some is injured, and they were still lying and suffer. And they put that stuff. They call it kalch. I don't know what they call it here. It's very, very. They used to. I used to put this around the trees back home around the fruit trees. I used to put it on for the bugs, not. To, not to come and to make it um, like a paint and smear it, the bark. Uh, so, anyways, and then they they had it open. They think till they till they ended up with all of them killed, all the people, and then uh, they closed the ghetto. They had, uh, uh, eliminated the ghetto, and us the people we were there about. Uh, from all kind, all kind of tradesmen, we were about 60, 70 people. They made a compound in the city, was a big building, I think three floors was a big building, and they had the, the, the where we were working, the factories there, everything, and they, and they made us to stay there, to stay and to work. They How long were you in the ghetto? What were the dates that you were in the ghetto? In the ghetto, in the ghetto wasn't long because they, they uh, they, that was uh, wasn't long. They, they was a couple of months. They didn't they didn't keep it long. So you know. when did you go into the ghetto? I, uh, it, it was in uh, mm -hmm. the July already. It was June the twenty sixth. We got free, and then uh, then uh, in the ghetto a couple of a week later, whatever it took, and uh, so we went uh, in the ghetto. But it wasn't uh, long. We 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 were there. I think. Uh, was one winter. One winter we were there. In the I ghetto? Yeah. One winter we were there in the ghetto, and I remember it was so horrible, so horrifying. It was so, because it was uh, 
it was uh, the next the next year it wasn't in the same year already and when was the liquidation the li the, 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 say the liquidation was uh, the, the, was the next year when, in, when in uh, 42 okay yeah that was when your sister and your mother were taken uh, yes 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 and uh, we remained in the, in, the, in the city compound and we were working there and uh, they made a special place and they were working there and we, and we slept there. What, uh, what, describe where you stayed in the city. What it was, was, a building, was a building, it was guarded by SS all around. We couldn't go out, uh, nothing, we couldn't go any place. And uh, we were working there, all kind of tailors, shoemakers, all kind of uh, uh, photographers and all kind of jewelry men, that whatever they had to fix, they had trades for everything, electricians and all kind of things, they had tra tradesmen left so much on this. One day, yeah, this I, I forgot to tell you yesterday and I'm going to remember now, this is very, very important, this is an unbelievable thing. And this is a, a such a historical thing. I, uh, they came, they came from a city like from here to Hamilton. They call it Resetze, the city, a small city called Resetze. And there was a compound with uh, German soldiers and officers, a whole, a whole set up there. And they needed a tailor. And they came to our place where I was working, and they wanted a, a tailor to make a suit for a general, a military suit. And I was working at that time, uh, I, by my tailor, I was working for uh, a year and something, I was working. And I was so good that I, 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 I watched what he's doing. When I went by him and asked him things, uh, what uh, uh, it has to do with the work, you know. I looked what he's doing when he cutting something and designing something. I was watching him, and it uh, got in my head, you know. So when they came from that uh, Rezekne, from that city, for a tailor, they needed a tailor to take over there uh, for to making a suit, and uh, they they picked me. I was only about seventeen and a half years old, but I was tall. And skinny, I looked a little bit older. So they took with a, a limousine. A limousine, they took me from the place where I was, and uh, they put me in the back seat, and two SS from both sides. And I was in the middle, and the, and the chauffeur. And they took me to that place. That's what I forgot to tell you yesterday, I reminded all night. And they took me to that place, it was a... a, a ruined city and they were almost just this building where they, they had the officers there, I mean the, the, the general there, the whole compound there was okay. So they uh, they brought me there, they put me in, in a burned down front a store. It was a street, was a, it looked like this was a, a commercial street and it was all stores burned down. And they put me in a store. Was there was uh, the windows was uh, was um, uh, uh, covered with the plywood and things like that. And they said, "You're gonna stay here." They locked it. They made it. You know, they didn't guard me there, but they 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 fixed it up that I shouldn't be able to escape. Uh, who would I escape? I wouldn't. I couldn't escape anyway because all Germans around me. You understand? So I uh, I went in in this company. I, I stayed overnight. And the next morning they come, open up the door, and they took me to the compound where the general is. And I had to make a suit for the general. They took me in to that compound, and they took me up. I, I, I was, I, I wasn't dressed like whatever I had to dress. I didn't have no clothes, nothing, gar garbage, schmattes I had. So uh, they took me into that compound, and the, and the general was sitting in a corner there with Hitler's picture big, maybe six foot by four, so huge, with the German flag from both sides. And the, the assistant who took me in was, uh, was me two star, two squares, this, this next to a general, was his assistant. And he said, in German, he said, das ist 
the Snyder Meister in German, he said. And uh, he told me what, what he wants, that he wants to make a suit. And uh, I said, okay. Then I started, he, he showed me the material and he gave me the material. And I never in my life cut a suit to make, I knew how to work on it. But to cut, I never knew. But when my bus was cutting, I was standing, sometimes asking questions, special coming to ask questions, just to see what he's doing. And uh, because I was very interested, I wanted to know. And I catched a little bit. And I, he gave me a jacket, I took his measurement there, the general, and he gave me a, he gave me a uniform to look what he wants. And I measured the uniform, all the places, whatever you have to do, and I designed on a, on a paper myself, which that was the first time in my life I did a thing like this. And I undertook that, that job. If I would spoil it, my head would go right away. So finally, not finally, it's not nothing finished yet. So I, I took the measurements from him, and I, I knew how to take the measurements, what to take, because the 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 the, the pants was the ones which has the not straight pants, but the tight, the tight here, with with the with the German green blue stripes, the big one on each side, about an inch and a quarter each side, and in the middle uh, a small one for the for the for the special pants. And the jacket was uh, with a hard collar, with uniform, with a with lapel, with the pockets, you know, with the pipings, with everything. And the whole jacket was made, was I had to make glue, to glue the canvas on it, because this is a military thing and it has to be with the big busts, you know, the busts. Uh, the, the, so with both sides was uh, uh, buttons, the, 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 the gold buttons. And I, I, I didn't have uh, to make the glue. I asked for some flour, and I was so. And I, I used to make that by my bus. And I made the glue. It had to be so smooth, so smooth, no bubbles, so smooth. Because when you put on the glue, you had to, you had to uh, press it with the iron, and everything had to be so smooth, like no glue, like it's natural. You understand? Very beautiful. And I made it, everything worked out beautiful, fine. I made the first trial. I came in and he escorted me, the, 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 the assistant general escorted me, and I tried him on the jacket. The first trial was very plain and simple, but to see if it fits, if it's nice. You know, he put it on and it was, and I put him on the pants for a trial. And I, it was really, really, really good. I was so happy that time. That I was scared that they're going to kill me. Anyways, I, it was beautiful. Then I came, I took it, measured everything fine. I'd come ho uh, to the place where I was working, and I, uh, uh, another three, four days, I came ag again for a try on the second time. The second time was already me there with the old trimmings, with the pockets, with the buttons. It was so beautiful. And the pants was almost finished, just the linings and this and this to finish up things like that. And he put it on, and he was so proud. He was he had a mirror in the corner and three way mirror. And when he stays in one in one position you can see all around him. It was unbelievable, you know. And I was so proud of that time, a young kid from seventeen and a half years old. With with a brain that I, I used it, but God give me this. It was unbelievable. And uh, I, one second. May I say something else? And uh, then uh, when I tried him on, I went home, and then in a couple of days later, I brought him home. This is very, very touching, very historic, what I'm going to tell you. And I brought him the suit that was completely finished, pressed, beautiful, nice. He, he put it on. It was like you put on a, on a figure in a showcase, and, and it stays there, no finger, no hand touched it, you understand? And uh, then... He, he put it on and he was so proud, he was so happy. He said to the assistant, assistant, he is a big, big man, he says, it is beautiful, it is unbelievable, in German. And he says, you know what, he says, you go down to the canteen. You know what's a canteen? 
we had to get the, the, the food, the, the stuff, we had to buy, you know, we had to get this food, the cigarettes, the whiskeys and the stuff and like this. He says, go down in Germany, he said, for, uh, go in uh, Gay and bring a, bring a, 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 a present for the Schneidermeister, they called me. And he brought a big box. The box was like a, almost like a Chesterfield size. It was, uh, I would say, uh, four feet long and, and three feet high. Packed with food, with everything in the world, whiskey. I had there a case he put in Lithuanian vodka, a Lithuanian vodka, and honey, and, and, and ham, cans of ham and everything. The appreciation for making such a beautiful job. When I came there, the 60, 70 people who was in that compound had to eat for a month. And I, 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 I it was so beautiful thing. They, they were so hungry, so skinny, so they couldn't, they couldn't breathe. And they had a, a spoonful of something they touched in their mouth. And that was the end of this story. <laughs> then it's going to come later more. What happened? You're going to, have to, you're going to have to stay all day. <laughs> How long did you stay in the compound? It's going to go on the... the, the when, when no, I mean, it's going to go on for long enough. To, to, okay. Well, just how long were you in the compound? How many in the compound, I was uh, for a couple of years. Okay. Okay? In compound, I was till, till uh, springtime 1944. Okay. And what happened then? Then? They, 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 they had to move. They, 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 they had to move from this city to, they went so far, they took around so far places, they, 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 they had to move from there, they, 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 they transferred them to a different place, they had to move away. And they, 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 um, I, they dismantled that compound, okay? So what happened to you? I'll tell you, what happened to me and the rest of the 60, 70 people who was in that compound, they took us to the, jail. As I told you yesterday the story, they took us to the to the jail. And there in the jail was all the the, the, the Russian, the biggest communists, the biggest, you know, what what was against it. They, they 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 took us in there to stay a day or two to till they're gonna transfer us to Riga. So they took us in in this place, and we stayed there a couple of days. As I told you, we was sta I was standing there in the in the hall. We were standing waiting till they're gonna accommodate us. And uh, I was uh, standing there, and I s they opened a gate, and they let out a convict. They opened a gate, and the gate was uh, I would say no more than four feet by four feet, and was a steel a steel door. And they let out a convict which uh, touched us so much, everyone, that we thought that that's going to be our end like this. That guy was there, he was on solitary confinement. It was a, like, like they put in a chicken coop. And he went out, was the, the, the clothes was uh, um, uh, rattled out from his body, only from the middle of the waist till, till the... Till till the shoulders was he had clothes the rest was eaten up and you could see the way the clothes was uh, was uh, rotten out you know it was not even it was hanging pieces and pieces like this and the guy's body was black black like I'm like an animal and uh, and then they uh, he want they they told him they 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 carried him somewhere they told him to go he couldn't walk he walked he walked on the feet he walked with, with the knees down he walked like like a, like a, he couldn't walk you know the, he well, he couldn't stand up he couldn't straighten himself out because he was there probably for years just going to pause for okay. a moment and continue on the next day thank you doing just you. Tape 4, Nissan Cease, September 13th, 1995. Please continue. When uh, 
when I was in that jail, when they took us before, they took us somewhere else for a couple of days. I saw that horror story of that man they took out from the from the cage. It didn't look like a man. It, it looked like an animal. I can't prescribe the name from an animal like this because his hair was till till the elbows long, and I guess filthy whatever it is. And you couldn't see a face to to see his face. You had to go over to the front of his face and, and move the hair away. You know, it was very, very, very touchy and very, I've never seen this. I hope nobody will see this in their whole life. After that, a day later, they came and told us they're going to take us to, from Vince, they're going to take us to Riga, Latvia. Riga, Latvia, this is the, the main city, the capital city of Latvia. They took us there, and we came there. It was a, a big compound, big compound. It was thousands of people, maybe four or 5,000 people there. And uh, they had all kinds of crafts, all kinds of people there, all kinds uh, organized. It was well organized. It was very well uh, kept, very well uh, like uh, put together everything, the places for the people, for the workers, for the, it was a huge place. And Where was it in, in the city? That was that was out out in Riga, but it was not in the in the city. It was outside of the city, and that call it Lenta, that place Riga, the, but that factory, and that compound called Lenta. Could you spell that? L e n t a Lenta. And what kind of? Where did you stay in Lenta? What were the uh, quarters we, like? We stayed right there. Were there barracks? Uh, no, no, it was, it was a big compound, a big build, big, big, huge compound building. One building. Yes, and we stayed, we stayed there, and uh, it was all kind, uh, all kind uh, craftsmen, all kind people, all kind uh, keep the young and older. We were there not uh, for long. We were there. Well, it was uh, was around uh, April, May. We came there, May. And what year was this? It was in 1944. We came there, and we weren't long there. And we stayed there till about uh, the end of August, the beginning of September. And that, that came out before uh, Rosh Hashanah. Now, while you were there, just to describe this compound, where did you sleep? We slept, they, they had, they had uh, special uh, rooms. We slept in a bulk, bulk uh, on the floor. Yeah, and uh, we walked there, we slept there, and, and there, and there I had my father. My father was with me. Your father was with you. Yes. What were the uh, what kind of food? How were you fed? The food that they they they, they fed. They they, they had uh, they had a, a kitchen where you had to go for the food, and they they give us the food it was uh, mostly uh, a soup and a piece of bread and and that's about that, you know. And sanitary facilities. Sanitary was was uh, was uh, indoors. Was was uh, running water. Was uh, indoors because this was a it's a big city and around there it's a big big everything was. And there. where where did you do your work? The work that special special uh, uh, halls there for every 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 tradesman for every day. They had special special rooms, special halls like a uh, hall for us. For 25 people to work, or have a hall for 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 50 people to work, whatever they needed for every time we are, and we worked there everything. We made all kind uh, all kind things, whatever they needed, and then they one day one day they came and they said they gonna uh, they called up was a big hall there where they had the meetings there, and they called up the they said all all, all people over 50 or should uh, all people over 50 should uh, come down to this in this place and they took away that time took away my father was 52 and uh, my father was there and uh, that was uh, before Rosh Hashanah and uh, they took him away and I was very very 
very touchy and uh, I, he was a very big smoker. He used to give away his piece of bread for a little bit of tobacco to have a cigarette. And I had a cigarette. I had his tobacco, a bag of tobacco. I made him a bag from, from, from linen. I made him a bag. And he had the tobacco. He could squeeze it. He could put it, me to tie it up. He, he could tie it up. He could around the waist, you know, with a, with a string or something like that. He should uh, somehow he forgot this, and uh, and I end up with this. And I wanted to to give it to him, and I didn't know what to do. And anyway, I found out, and I uh, the entrance there, and I went tried to go in where they locked them in there because you, they couldn't get out from there. They were locked in and guarded by SS. And I went in in that place there and I, and I, I saw him and he, he made a face and he turned unbelievable. His normal, normal skin from the face it turned black. It turned such a color that I didn't recognize my father in seconds. He says only a couple of words. He says, why, why did you have to, why did you come in for this? He says, I don't need this. I don't need nothing anymore. He says, but the only thing maybe, maybe God sent you, he says, because uh, if uh, you will be able to go out from here, our name our family sees will still be will still be in exist but what before that he was so emotional he took his hands and he grabbed his cheek and he ripped out pieces of his cheek the the the, the, the flesh he ripped out he said why did you have to come in why well, because uh, they didn't want to let me out and somehow i don't know what happened uh, I, I, it happened that i i i got out how did it happen? I can't remember, but it was very, very unbelievable, especially the circumstances of my father, the way he turned in himself like not a human face. He got in, in, a, in, a, in a few seconds of that living through this horror, what he lived through. And uh, they took him away, and then uh, a couple of weeks later, they, they took out all the people from the Lenta from the, uh, the whole compound, and they took him to the concentration camp, to Stutthof. And this, this was by Danzig, Poland. How many people were left? Huh? How many people were left in Lenta? Oh, it was, a, uh, it was a couple of thousand people. And they took you? They took us all on a boat, a big boat they, in Danzig. They, they, they took us to, from the Riga, Riga port, they took us to Danzig. What kind of Poland. boat? A, a huge boat, a, a big boat, not a passenger boat, but a big boat with a couple of floors. And they put in the people in that boat. They told them to run. And they went in in the boat, and they were, they were so squeezed together, like, like sardines. They squeezed, it was like maybe two and a half thousand people there. And so many, it was so crowded, it was so, no food, no nothing for the whole, uh, for the whole um, thing that he took to to go there, it took it took overnight, it took overnight to go there. From the, the, the uh, we were going all night. It was a huge ship, and people were dying there on the ship, uh, on the boat. They didn't have what to eat, and they were squeezed together. They, so they, 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 the Germans, they, they what they did, they, somebody somebody died. They took him by, they took the body and they threw him in 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 in, in, the, in the sea. You know, this is how I took uh, overnight, and we came to the to the camp, to the Stutthof. Camp to Stutthof, that's by Danzig, and uh, they um, uh, brought us in, and they had a uh, big gate to come in. They, they counted or whatever everybody, they counting everybody coming in, and they had barracks, wooden barracks, and uh, in one barrack was uh, maybe four or five hundred people. How big was the camp? How big is Stutt was Stutt 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 was, it, There was about, uh, I, my number was uh, uh, 96,254. And it was, uh, it was coming people after that. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, was uh, maybe about uh, 350,000 people in there. At one time? Yes, yes. And, and then they, when they brought us in, they gave us a place. Uh, and it was, 
just uh, you know like a plain barrack in the, in the in the beds to sleep was uh, again the same thing was three 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 way high you know uh, long long things you know from wood made uh, and uh, how many people slept in a bunk in, in a bunk it was uh, maybe a couple of hundred people no, no, in, in each bunk how many people in Oh, no, but it was along, was along from one end oh. barrack to the other. You understand? Okay. Mm -hmm. And when they put us in, they put us in. They didn't put it in head to head. They put in head and feet, like sardines. You know, that was unheard of in life. They put us like sardines. You take out from a from a from a can. They put take off less space. Somebody put my the feet in my nose or in my face and so. You understand? Mm -hmm. And one one time I I woke up. I. I I felt something, something tied to my body. Somebody, somebody was uh, didn't woke up in the morning. He was dead because there was no food, no nothing, and uh, and was uh, was uh, suffocated. Were there any sanitary conditions? The sanitary okay. conditions was uh, uh, to was one one room, one big room, and was a uh, one pipe for water to wash the face, maybe. I would say a couple of hundred feet long by as wide as this room, about uh, 14 feet wide. And that was the, the washroom that you could wash yourself or whatever you want. Cold water, no hot water, but lots and lots of taps. You know, every every two feet was a tap because lots of people at once came in there. And then the washrooms was there. So what did you do at Stuttgart? Did you work? Yes. Yes, they, then then they took us to to work uh, till everything settled down. Everybody settled down. Then they come around. Uh, they took us for for work, all kind of things. They took me to work. It was a place not. Uh, we had to go out from the camp, but it was guards with dogs. This was a uh, maybe a half an hour walk, and it was a place on the top of the hill. And we were, had to walk on the bottom of the hill. It was, I would say, uh, maybe three times as high as this house. About, uh, I would say, about 30 feet, 28 feet high. Down, we had to go down. What was the job? We had to cut forest, cut forests. And we had to cut forest. The trees was high, like the higher, the, like like the the the, the big uh, electric poles on the street if you see that uh, I don't know how many feet that is maybe maybe who knows it's so high three three story high four story high we had to cut these trees and bring it over on top by people that was so heavy 40 50 people had to carry this tree up on the hill and there was trucks standing there we had to load it on the trucks and where they took them I don't know but we we people had to cut the tree and clean up the branches and put it, the long trees on top of the truck. And every time we came from the day's work finished, we had to carry six to eight people dead from the work, fell down, we had to carry on our shoulders. And we carried, we had to go to the camp and carry on the shoulders and carry to the crematorium. The crematorium was three ovens there. Black, uh, black uh, doors. They used to pull out a uh, pull out a door. You came out a frame from from metal, and they used to put the body on this, on this uh, in front of our eyes. They used to put on the body on this uh, metal um, frame, and shovel it in in the fire. The fire was red as anything. At night you could see the chimney, the fire. You could see out the fire, maybe. 20, 50, 30 feet high in the night especially, you could see the fire was flaming like, like anything. And the, 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 that was going on from day to day. I went to this place a couple of times, I couldn't get out. At one time I, I hide myself and I couldn't, I couldn't, I said I cannot go there anymore because that will be my end. And I hide myself, and they took me to a different place. Where did you hide? What? When you hid, where did you hide? In the block. I didn't go out. In the block. I hide it, and they, and they called, and I didn't go out, and I hide it there. 
After that, I another 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 company came and they took me to work somewhere else. What was the company? That was a company what they brought from the war. They brought the clothes. I said I'm a tailor. They brought the clothes from the war. They brought the clothes from the killed, wounded soldiers, the German uniforms, with the, with the train. And they brought with, with the black box cars, you know, full of this. And that was near the crematorium was the train. So we had to go there and unload it, unloaded this and um, uh, take it on trucks and go and take it to the to the uh, factory where they fix these clothes. They wash it and, f and, and fix it and they put it back in bundles and send it back to the army. Whoever was uh, ripped out the holes and this, it, they, that was the factory where I was working too. And when, uh, when, uh, when the, the transport came, with the, with this, the train came with this clothing, I had to, we, they took us there to unload this and take it to the factory. And I, uh, and I uh, was working there. Then they, uh, they uh, did uh, things like they had to, they had to uh, take more people and they couldn't uh, accommodate, you know, because there was so much work coming on. And, and one time, one time when I unloaded, yeah, this came back to my mind, one time when I, I unloaded uh, a pile of clothing and it was very heavy, and it was unusually heavy to have clothing, uh, 10 garments or 15 garments or 5 garments, whatever, it was unusual, I found a half a body from a human. In the, in the bundle of that clothing. And what we went through there, it was unbelievable. We couldn't have uh, much, uh, we, didn't, we had a little bit better food. Why? Because in the tailor shop, somebody, somehow we got some potatoes, except the rationing, what they give us. After the day's work, when we came in the camp, they, they, they made an appeal. An appeal was that they put out like an army and they counted everybody. And they counted everybody to to check if everybody's uh, not, nothing, nobody is missing. So they 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 counted everybody, and then they one one uh, something was not matching the their papers, you know, and that was very 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 cold. Then time, that was in, uh, in February, I think, that was before the evacuators, that was in February, it was very, very cold. We almost uh, stayed all night till they counted, it was something short, was missing some person, and they had maybe 300,000 people standing for hours in the winter night, the moon was in full, in full face. And the cold was the unbelievable, and we stayed there like this till they found out that uh, they, they found out th th what was missing. One person, well, like after the appeal, we going in in the, in the hall and they have on tables rationing their bread. That time they give us the bread and our soup. So the the bread is lying on the on the table rationing small small little pieces of bread. So one guy was hiding in the, under a table somewhere in a corner there, and he was eating the bread. And everybody was outside, and they, 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 they didn't know, they didn't know that he was missing. Anyways, they found out, they, they, uh, they found him there, and uh, they went in and took him out. What they did, they put on the hook, and they hanged him in front of the 350,000 people, in front of everybody, for doing this thing, because of him, you know, for understanding this. And, uh, and then uh, after, after that, we tried to, to uh, 
we went back to the compounds and we were frozen to death. Some people that they were so frozen, some had the, the feet was the skin was uh, was uh, peeling off from the from the frost. And then a uh, uh, a week or ten days later, they start uh, to evacuate us from this camp because the Russian they they they, they start to come close. The Russians start to come. Uh, Closer to the, they were there to evacuate. So they took us by by foot. We were walking about three weeks. We were walking day and night. We were walking to the to the countryside, not to the city, but to the countryside. People shouldn't see it. And we were walking for three weeks. We were walking day and night. At night they stopped uh, on a fa in a farm uh, farm, and they put us in in a once once uh, I remember was. Was uh, was the best night of the of, of the whole of the whole exodus when we had when it was was a full a full um, uh, uh, stable with with cows in the winter time by in a stable from cows it's warm you know and they had hay and everything you know so and they give us uh, some uh, boiled uh, soup from the beets from the where they give feed the cows they they they, they give us the the food. And we eat this food, and uh, we were warm. That was the best night of the of the whole uh, of the whole exodus that time because it was wo a, wo a warm thing. Anyways, yeah. What did you use to eat? Did you have any utensils? Nothing. Nothing. I had a I had a bucket like a, a from a from a, a can from 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 can from from food a can like when you buy a, a can food an empty can. It was a big one, it was like a liter the size. And you kept that with you? I kept this always with me. And they put it, they put in one shovel, one, 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 one big spoon, you know, like the, this kitchen thing or they have a big, a big uh, thing, maybe a liter or something. And uh, they put in, in the, you know, if they put in, if they put in good, you had good. If they, sometimes they spill half out, you had a, you had a quarter of it. One time, I, they, they, they put it on, on me and, uh, and they put just water, was the, the, no, no, no thick stuff, you know. And I hold that. I says, what, what did you give me there? You know what they did? The heavy thing, he had a heavy sh thing with a, with a long, with a long uh, hand, a long handle, a metal handle, a long thing. And he, uh, he gave me a knock over my hand. And I, 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 I couldn't use my hands for a long time. When was that? That was uh, before. On the walk? And the, yes, yes. Yes. He gave me a knock me the thing why I why I stayed and wanted more soup. I didn't want more soup. It doesn't go in, in that can more soup, but it goes in he put in water and I I want a little bit thick stuff to have a little bit of energy. And uh, that that's how uh, it was uh, a terrible experience at that time. How many people were on the walk? Oh there was a couple of thousand people. Yes. And who was guarding you? SS, with, with dogs, German Shepherd. Yeah, I wanted to tell you now. My boss was there behind me walking, too. He was a very, very short fellow. He was maybe, I don't know, five foot four or something. He was maybe not even there, a short fellow. And he fell down and uh, he couldn't walk anymore. And they didn't no, he didn't have no courage to walk anymore. And they, they put on the, the, the German Shepherd on him and... Uh, Everybody who fell down, they couldn't walk anymore. They put the German shepherd and he, he ripped out the neck. That's what, they were, that, that's what they were trained for. Nothing touched the body, nothing. Just they, they took the neck and ripped it out. And, and, and the head was hanging on the backbone of the whatever. And then, uh, and then we were uh, uh, going, that was uh, for three weeks, and then was already close the, you could hear the aeroplanes running with bombs falling so they they took us was a city next next to the last last uh, stop we, they took us to that city and they uh, there was a jail there and they took us uh, to this jail the jail was packed everything was packed the only thing wasn't packed was the halls because I don't know how many floors, four floors, I think, was the, the, 
so the, the whole people from the com from, from our exodus they put into the to this jail and they put him in the halls it was so crowded they they pushed people in because there wasn't enough room they pushed in standing up and you couldn't fall you couldn't lift a hand you couldn't move me the, the head nothing but they squeezed in one in the other and then in the in the middle of the night, you started to hear bombs falling, bombs falling, and sirets, what they call it, the, 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 the alarms, sirets, sirets start to go, and the alarms start to go, and it was, so what they did, they, they, they opened up the doors, and they told us to go on the, on the compound yard from the jail, on the, on the, on the, on the outside. We went uh, everybody in the back uh, on the outside, and people start to come down so many. And then in the front of the, uh, that was where the, uh, the going down to the basement was a steps, was a long steps, maybe as long as this room, uh, maybe uh, five, six steps. And they said, uh, very wide, and they said everybody to go, to run there, to run there. And they're standing from both sides with machine gun and shooting shooting everybody, everybody's falling in there. And I, and I was, uh, I was a little bit far away, maybe 150 feet from there. And then, and uh, I, uh, a little bit, I was away from the, the crowd and I saw a manhole. And I, uh, I said to myself, this, this is gonna be my savior. And the manhole, I didn't have courage to, to, to lift up the, the thing from the manhole. And I went, I opened up uh, some of the head holes big enough to put in my finger. And I managed to lift it up a little bit and I put my foot. I didn't have no shoes. I give away my shoes for, for a bread. I had boots, my father made me, and I had the boots all the time. And I gave away the boots for a bread. And I had the bread under my arm till I finished them. I, I, eat, I, I, eat, I eat half lice than bread because the body was full of lice. When I was free, that uniform, what I have from the concentration camp, I, I had to send it three, four times to a special place to, 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 to clean it and to uh, humify, I, I'll call it hum, humify, whatever, to, to take out the, 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 the bugs from the lice. And then I made, I made this picture. That was about uh, six months later. What did you wear on your feet after you gave away the boots? I had, I had uh, uh, ripped around uh, from, from bags, from potatoes, tied around the feet. It was wet, walking in the snow, winter in February, walking with this in the snow, was the snow was that high. It was very high and uh, you put in a foot, you couldn't take it out. I don't know how, how I got my strength. I, uh, I don't know how I got my strength to, to, to lift up the foot. And then, uh, and to go out every day because they, when they took us to the, to the farm, to the countryside, that was so much snow, the wind blows so high that sometimes you, you short people, you couldn't see them. You had to walk to. When you got to this jail, what city were you in? Uh, it was uh, Neustadt. Can you spell that? Uh, in Polish, it was Wejerowa. In, in German, it was Neustadt. Where was it? It was around Danzig. So you were telling us about the manhole cover. Pardon? You lifted up the manhole cover. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, I didn't finish it. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So I lifted up the manhole cover. This was very important. I went a little bit uh, out of uh, line. It's the first time. I'm sorry. And I lifted up the manhole cover, and I, 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 I saw, I put out a little bit my eyes, and I saw that uh, I saw Russian uniforms already on the compound. I lifted up the, the, the thing and I and I managed I had my feet in the side of the inside of the of the of the manhole I had my feet on the side of the walls because it was uh, uh, stones there concrete whatever and it was rough and I could hold on to it it wasn't smooth like uh, like you know and I could hold on to it to stay on it and then I uh, we're just going to pause and we'll continue in the next tape okay about the manhole
Oh, we have a lot. Tape number five, Nissan Cease, September 13, 1995. Please continue. Well, that was the story from the manhole when I reached out. Uh, first I heard, I opened up a little bit and I heard the Russian language voices. I was a little bit more confident in me that uh, something good is going to happen to us. So I uh, lifted up more and I lifted out the, the whole manhole on the side with the strength I got. I don't know because that was so heavy and it was metal, heavy metal thing. And I mean, how it got me, I don't know how many uh, pounds, maybe 100 pounds or 75 pounds, very heavy. And I lifted up and I, a Russian soldier was in front of me and he, and he, and he helped me up. And he, as, as he helped me up, he took me around and he hugged me. I couldn't stay on my feet, nothing. And he hugged me and he, he squeezed me and uh, he says to me like this, he says, I am from a battalion with the tanks and I am the captain from the tanks and from even the first tank stepped in in this place. It was his honor to walk, to, uh, to walk by and see what's going on and by the end of the, I don't know how many hundreds of tanks was there in, the bat in that battalion and when the last tank he says, I'm sorry, he says in Russian, he talked to me in Russian because I understand everything. And uh, he says he has to go. At the end of the tank, he has to go. So he took out, uh, he put in the hand in the pocket. So he took out the hand in the pocket and he put out uh, some chocolates. He had some candies and he gave it to me. And he says, I'm very happy. He was a Jewish, a Jewish commander, a dark, a dark, dark hair, such a handsome guy. And it was so so touchy, you know, to hear that. And then, after he went away, he started to come in more the soldiers from the, from what they occupy already. He's the one who fight to go farther ahead, you understand me, the tanks. Then another group, the infantry, they call it, whatever, you know, they're coming in and they occupy that uh, place and they, uh, and they organize everything under their uh, law, under the Russian law, you know. So they uh, they started to, to we couldn't we could move we were so we were so so skinny and so we, the body uh, he touched me you know he, he he was crying my hands my body my bones was I weighed about 37 kilo I don't know how many pounds this is 70 78 pounds whatever and my you're gonna excuse me what I'm gonna say that, that, that my behind the bones was well, was no meat on it the body was no meat and the bones from the behind was sticking out was sticking out like 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 like, like a, a piece of something you know with no no skin no nothing on it it was un unbelievable I couldn't walk so what they did they they uh, they confiscated our compound where it was the big officer's uh, compound, a huge, beautiful place. And it was like, 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 like a castle, like a castle. And the, the, and the people who was uh, unable to walk and so they accommodated them there in the beautiful castle there with the, with the beautiful furniture, with the, the officers, a big, huge thing with, with beds, with the cushions, with the, with the, with the Blankets with the uh, feather beds, with the unbelievable. Was so, uh, and the Russian nurses, they right away started to work on us to, to, to give us medication and see what they can do to make us uh, a little bit uh, nourishing and stronger. Uh, I had a friend of mine. Uh, he was in Colorado. I don't know if he's still alive. Isaac Micklin, his name, and. Uh, and he didn't, he didn't feel good at that time. When, and, uh, and they start to revive him, and they did revive him. And then another, another friend of mine, we were three together, all of us three, he started to eat, and they gave him food, and nothing could hold in the stomach. 
nothing and uh, everything what he was taking into the mouth went in the other way around and nothing could hold. And uh, I was lucky when they give me something to eat. I, I survived. It took a little bit longer time and uh, I survived and they uh, uh, they uh, try to um, cook food specially for people like us, you know. It was nurses and doctors, women doctors too, from the nurses, you know. It was with the Red Cross, they had a bandage on it. And it was a beautiful staff from, from the Russian medical teams right away around you, and they they tried to do everything possible. Well, we were there for quite a while there. How long did you stay there? Yeah, there maybe about uh, six to eight weeks. We stayed there till they got us a little bit back on, uh, a little bit How back many there. people were there in the patients? It was, I don't know, it was about maybe 40, 50, something like that. Because uh, the, the, the only two car on there, the people who couldn't couldn't walk, you know, they were, they were so um, un, un, uh, they couldn't the health was so so uh, touched that they couldn't do nothing, and then they uh, they start to give us uh, more food and everything, and then they they s they took us. They said that we can go. You are already a little bit stronger that uh, we can go in the in the, the compounds where in the city where it belongs to the to the Russian uh, military and there was already more more open they didn't need the, so much medical attention because they, they straightened us out and we could eat already and so and there you could uh, have more food and more salad food and more of everything we stayed there a couple of months now, what date were you liberated? I was uh, liberated March the 10th, 1945. And you went from there to the compound, and so when did yeah. you leave? I leave, I leave the compound around uh, May, around May. And you went from and there? From there we went to, they said that in Lodz, in Poland, is after the war was uh, uh, all the Jews who survived they tried to concentrate in Lodge. It's going to be the center of the of the Jewish uh, survivors, uh, and it was like that. You know, it was so many, so many people there. Uh, so when uh, so we came there. How did we came there from there? We had to go. We had to go. Uh, wasn't nothing like are you going to a station and buy a, a ticket? They had to go to the railroad station and sneak into the to the to the train and it uh, wasn't a uh, wasn't a uh, passenger train was the freight trains you know uh, people climb on the on the on the stairs uh, and they hold themselves up tie themselves up to the to the bars from the from the door you know from the things and uh, between the where in the corner where between the trains you know the salad bars and some went on the roof you know but on the roof was the dangerous thing because the roof wasn't straight and the roof was a little bit uh, oval. And uh, when sometimes they went to a bridge, it was only about a couple of inches room for, for the train to go through, it wasn't that high enough, the bridge. And, uh, and uh, the people got killed. So I, I, I pushed myself to the end of the, of the, of the train uh, by the side where the where the, uh, the oval thing comes to, to lower, and I was lying right on the end and holding an iron bar where they had the, the doors, where they open up, the uh, bar uh, goes from up and down the whole height, and I hold it on to this, and I, I managed and uh, managed to survive this, this uh, 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 way. And we came to watch, and we came to watch. Uh, we, uh, we we took us we took us to uh, the Jewish community, and we find out uh, first of all people where they uh, where they live and where you can get accommodations to stay. Who were you with? I was with a friend. The one is uh, in uh, in uh, Colorado. It used to be Isaac Mitlin. And when you say you went to the Jewish community, where specifically did you go? That was that was in Lodge. 
in Lodz. When we came to Lodz right. with the Jewish community there, and then they helped us to, to they, they told us where to go to find the place. Where were they uh, set up? Where? Well, in the city, in Lodz. In, in a building, in a synagogue? Yeah, in a building, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, buildings. What was Lodge like when you got there? What did you find? The Lodge was, uh, was a little, it looked so like not touched. Lodge was so, so, so normal, everything was touched. We, they took us where was the ghetto. The Lodge ghetto was there. They took us in the outskirts of Lodge, where the Lodge ghetto, there was everything ruined. And in Lodge, everything, all the buildings were standing. And the, the streets, the streets was, uh, we went there, uh, we went, uh, they took us, somebody took us on the, on the street, was uh, Pietrkova uh, 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 Street, they call it in Polish, Pietrkova uh, 83, I think it was the number, and somebody, somebody from my friend lived there, and, um, and he was, uh, he was a tailor, and uh, he got us organized a little bit, and we start uh, to, to help out, and and that's how we got a little bit of commendation to, to stay. And we got a little bit of food, and he, he had connections with, uh, with tailoring, you know. And we stayed there a couple of months. Where did you stay? I mean, what, where were your accommodations? In, 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 in an apartment? In a, it's an apartment, an apartment complex. Not a, not a, not a, uh, a private com apartment complex. In, in, in large was the buildings was uh, mostly apartment complex. There was no, no private houses like here, you know. There's, it was mostly b apartment buildings. And we were there, there a couple of months there. And, and then, then what happened? And then what happened? Then I, I decided to go to, uh, I want to go to my, to my country, to Latvia. So I went to, I took the train and I went to, I wanted to go to, to Poland in Bialystok, and I went to Bialystok, and, uh, and I, I asked for connections how to go to the, to Latvia, and to go to, uh, to the border, there was uh, the border, they call Grodna, Grodna was a Russian town, and I went, uh, I went over there by the, with a train from, uh, from, uh, from Lodz, and on the way to Grodna from Bialystok, was a train was uh, going, we went on a train, and what uh, on the train was, was uh, going around the fascists, was going around and, and, and finding, finding out that there's Jewish people on the train. And they, they, they killed and they threw them down from the train. These the were? These were, fi they, they, AK, they called them Akovtsis, they called them AK, they, the Russian, the Polish uh, fascists. They had a, they had a, a blue uniform in their, in their army, but but they uh, they uh, they had a lot of followers, you know. So, so they uh, they threw out the, the, uh, about six or seven people I knew. They threw them down from the train, and we went to the to the border. And I uh, and then when I, I came to the border, I went down. We I saw one one young fella came. He says, I went through so much. He says, I went to Dvinsk after the war, got and I took look for my family, and I found nothing, he says. And I give everything what I had to come back. And he had everything what he did. He didn't have nothing with him. Whatever he had, uh, uh, he had money, whatever he had, uh, he gave everything. And they took him to a, through, the, through the places where the partisans you know, go through to, to the woods, to the places where the, the border, you couldn't go to the regular border, you know, there. So they took him there and he came uh, and he came back and he says, you crazy, he says, I, I lost my life nearly and I give everything away what I had and I, uh, and I came back and I'm lucky that I'm back because there's nothing in the wings, there's no, everything is ruined, the was ruined completely, was, was no building, nothing there, was, was ruined, there. everything was ruined. And uh, I'm coming back. Uh, you going to we, we, we cancel that? And what did you do? Uh, well, you I, I went back to to uh, Varsha, not on Varsha, but on the other side of the wa the uh, the water was uh, the, 
the uh, Prague was a, and the other side of the of the lake was called Prague, a city, not Warsaw, but on the other side, the same thing like here, Lake Ontario from this side is Toronto, and over there is uh, something else, you understand? So they called Prague. This was still in Poland. That was still in Poland. And I, we went in there and we stopped and, uh, and we went in uh, and we were looking uh, for something. We found a, uh, found a, Russian, a Russian soldier and we were talking to him. He says that he's, they have a compound here and they have a, they have a tailoring, uh, a tailoring um, uh, complex where they do the tailoring for the officers and uh, they need, uh, they can use us if we can do that. And the, the, the good idea was that uh, if they took us in and they uh, we could uh, get accommodation. That's what, that was the main thing, because you could get no accommodation now whatsoever, because you needed money, and the money was, uh, was not, the Polish money wasn't uh, the real money, <coughs> and they, uh, they give us accommodation, they give us work, and they, uh, and they, uh, 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 we were working there for about four months. And then, uh, and then about uh, in uh, oh, November, November 45, I was, uh, we were thinking to go out from Poland to go away and in the, in the German zone, American zone in Germany. Why did you want to leave Poland? Uh, because uh, nothing, we couldn't go home to Dvinsk, no, nothing is there, and Poland, I'm not po Poland, uh, it's not my country. And we want to, what they go, they, they told us that in an Amer American zone in Germany, in Munich, is a new a new camp, uh, a new arrangement to all the people who come from uh, from uh, the American zone. They concentrated in in Munich, you know, and uh, a lot of people from all over they come to the to their place there because they can accommodate them. And then we we did uh, uh, from there the, we came to the Jewish committee in, in Munich. And uh, when I when I went uh, yeah I went I came back I went back when I came to to Poland I went when I came to the Munich before Munich and the American zone American zone in Berlin yeah I decided to, uh, what came in my head I decided to go back to Poland and to make from Berlin from Berlin and uh, I, I uh, and I, may, I I I had a few dollars and I got some pieces of cloth and I bought some cloth uh, about 40 pieces of cloth and I went back to Poland and I uh, and I started to to sell it and uh, to make a few dollars and go back because I had a paper to go not a ticket but I had a paper the commander gave me where I was working. They gave me a commander that I go to see in Berlin, I see my sister. She was freed from the camp and she lives, she's in Berlin. So I... Uh, this is what you had told him? Uh, yes, that's what I had told him. It wasn't really the, the, the... It wasn't really the sister. You understand? But I just said that it's my sister. I go to Berlin because I wanted to go. And this was still good for another week. And I... Uh, so what did you do with I, the clock? The cloth I came to Poland and I sold it, and I got, got the money by the end of the thing when I sold it. Some some hold up uh, guys they, they they made a hold up on me and they took everything away the money what I sold the cloth and everything. Some cooks you know, and they took away everything from me you know, and I left with nothing. So I went uh, I went back to Berlin. I, I, I still had the, the the paper that I can go. I went back to Berlin and I went to the place where I was there and the American, um, and the American zone and I, I went in the place where the German they kept us there we stayed there a private room is they kept they gave us accommodation for a few a few days <coughs> and I hide it uh, 
I had it a few dollars in the in the drapes there, and I came back and I went right away to the to the place where I put it away, and I found that, and then I went there, tried to go to Munich. It was very hard to go out from the American occupied uh, Germany, Berlin, to the American zone, Germany, to go to Munich. But I made it, and I came to. How did Munich. you go? How did you make it? By train. And I went by train, and I went to me, came to Munich, and I, my friend, who he, who he didn't want to go back to Poland, I went back, and he says, uh, I found out that he stays in Saint Ottilien, in Munich. That is a, a coup, a, 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 not a coup, but it's a, it's like a, a place, like a sanatorium, and it was run by nuns. Was run this thing, was run by nuns, and uh, he was there. Uh, they told me that he was there because he wasn't well, and they they, they gave him uh, to 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 get to himself. So <coughs> I went uh, there and I found them, and, uh, and the, the 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 show when we we met each other, that was unbelievable. He was crying and I was crying, and he said, "Why did you go again?" He said, he was, "I says I don't know why, why because I had the papers was good, and I thought I was driving." I was going in the train, was going with the Russian soldiers, and they were very, very, very good to me, and I understand the, I understand the language and everything, and they, uh, and I didn't have no problems, and I said, I can make it, so I'll go, but I made a mistake, but uh, thank God that we saw each other, and we come back. When, when was this? That was in, uh, in uh, de December. December 45. And you're now in Santo Tillian? Yes. Okay. What, so what happened, what did you do in Santo Tillian? Oh, nothing. They just kept us to, to, uh, to, to gain weight. To gain weight. After Santo Tillian, I was, I looked like this already. Then I, I before I left Santo Tillian, I made this picture. Who was running Santo Tillian? It was running by the, by the government. It was a private, not a private, but it was run by nuns. Nuns, only the, the doctor, the, only the sisters, everything was run, everything was run by nuns. Now yeah, during this time, what efforts did you make to find out about the rest of your family? Those yeah. members that you didn't know about? The, for, for my family? Yeah. Well, I, I, well, I knew that they, they are not, uh, I, uh, I, I didn't do nothing there because I had to, uh, it took uh, quite a long time la later, a couple of, uh, one, or one and a half, two years later, when uh, they started uh, uh, to come, they made a, a camp, one camp here, one camp there, and it was like, I was in Knife Reimann in Munich, and they had in uh, Ferenwald, and they had in Salaspils, and they had, uh, it's around Munich, you understand? And they had a couple of camps, and they had uh, they had uh, all kind of people coming from all over, and they and they organized that uh, should be available for them information and everything. Uh, when was that? That was in uh, that was in 1947. Right. So you stayed in Santa Tillian for how long? No, in Santa Tillian, I didn't stay long. Say about uh, about three months. And then where did you go from there? I go to Munich, and in Munich they give me the Jewish committee. I went to the Jewish committee and they gave me a place, uh, and they told me to go in a place to, 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 to rent private. I went in a place across from the camp and I rented private. Then the camp opened up, Knife Freiman opened up, uh, and uh, so I went in, in, in the camp. Uh, because in the camp, on the, on the, on the across from the camp, on the other side of the street, was private. The private I had, I got, uh, the f I got from the government, from the German government, they gave me food stamps to live on, okay? I didn't have to pay rent, but I had food stamps they gave me. But in, in, the, in the camp, in the, in the Knife Reimann camp, I got uh, everything free. I got accommodation, I got the f uh, food, I, uh, I, was, uh, I was getting food and everything. And, uh, what were the accommodations like? Accommodations was... Uh, Small houses, very small houses, was like a store and a half here, you know what's a store and a half? The two rooms upstairs and three rooms downstairs, with the two bedrooms upstairs, was a store and a half, small houses, and I met my friend, he had one room upstairs. 
and the room was, uh, uh, you know, the ceiling wasn't straight, it was like that, because it was uh, like a store and a half, that they, like the attic one was uh, finished like for living for us, and here the, the attic is uh, attic, you understand what I mean? Where did you eat? Where, where were you Okay. Fed? Now, the, the commandant from the Knife Ryman was uh, uh, an American officer from Riga. And my friend, Rafri, he was from Riga. I'm from Dvinsk. So we had a little bit connections. Free already. We had, we had protection, like we call it, okay? So he gave us, me and my friend, he gave us a car, and we went because we didn't have nobody, we didn't have where to cook, and uh, we got a cart and we went in, in the restaurant where the Af American officers, they had a restaurant there where the, the whole compound had the, the, the committee there, and the officer was a big officer, uh, American officer, and they had a cook there, and they cooked for the, for the officers. They had, a, they had a, a, a kitchen and they had a restaurant, and we got two carts each. Uh, one of each, and uh, we, uh, we went in there three times a day to eat with a cart. Did you work while you were in there? Uh, no. No, because they give you the food and the accommodation. Was the only thing they did was uh, to have a good time, and uh, it was entertainment. It was a big hall there. Across from the camp, there a hall, and they, and they confiscated, and they made uh, all kinds of concerts, Jewish concerts, and all kinds of things, because I stayed there till 1948. Three years. I got married in 1947. Where did you meet your wife? My wife in Santo Tillian, there where I was by the nuns. She came. She came from another from another camp. I forgot what they call it. Bamberg. Yeah, Bamberg. She came like she had words in her hand, and they come. She come to 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 check the hands, and and I met her there, and uh, uh, we were sitting in uh, in the, in the and t uh, we were playing all kind of games, all kind, you know, for the patients there to enjoy themselves, to occupy themselves. And we, I was playing domino, and she came in, and we were talking, she was sitting in me, we were talking. And then she said, she's going away tonight. And I said, how are you going, how, how, how will it be possible that we're going to meet again? So she gave me the address. You know, and I wrote a letter, and she was, that was unbelievable. She said, when they, she got the letter that, uh, the whole campers, all your friends was going around and said, I to hear how lucky she is. You know, I wrote the, the, on, the, on the beginning of the letter, I, 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 I painted two doves, two loving doves, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I wrote, and then I wrote my, 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 my story, you know? It was so beautiful. And she said, she always kept it, as, you know? And uh, then a uh, couple of months later, we got married. It was in February. What February was the date? When did 25. You get February 25, 1947. And where did you get married? In Munich. Where in Munich? Uh, in Munich was in the city. We got that. I didn't have. Uh, I just had a rabbi who made the, the thing, and I had one witness. Yeah. And I had the ksuva. I made written in a ksuva. Yeah, the ksuva. Written in the ksuva. Everything. In. So my, my son is so religious when we, uh, last year, uh, he, he, had, he took us, a rabbi came from Israel and he's familiar with them and they made uh, by Braunfman. Braunfman uh, he invited us to come there and, uh, and uh, he did lots of things for Jewish people and he, he says uh, he has to change the ksuva. Uh, one word was something not right written. So he rewrote it. Now I have the the rabbi from Israel, and he wrote the Ksuv, it was uh, Feb really? February the 28th, 1977, I married, in 1947, and 1947, my oldest son was born in December, the 17th, okay. and we're just the same gonna, year. We're going to pause. Thank you. Next take. Tape 6, Nissan Cease, September 13, 1995. After you got married, where did you, what is your wife's name? Helen. Okay. Helena, she says. Helena. But Helen. So what Helena. did you and Helena do? Do. 
okay. We got married, and I got uh, my accommodations in Neifreimann, Munich, in the camp. And I, uh, my friend, my friend who was living with me in that room, he got married a couple of months before. And uh, he left me with a nice accommodation because I had enough room. It was a small little room, and it was very, very interesting. And when uh, my wife uh, and I, we got married, we came back to my place, and I was living there on the bottom floor, was living uh, a family with uh, a husband and a wife and a little girl, a couple of months old, and uh, a grandmother. And upstairs we had one room and another couple had another room. And uh, the room was, uh, I was living was very, very nice. I kept it so beautiful it no from nothing. I decorated the room, was so beautiful. I had a, a couch, it was not a couch, it was uh, just a, a couple of feet and I made a I made a frame and I put a couple of American blankets and I made it, it looked like a really couch, you know, it was very nice, the room was very cozy, it was small, very small, and... Uh, How long did you stay there? I stayed there till we left to Canada. When was that? This was... Uh, nine, nine, wait a minute, 1948. Do you remember the uh, date? It was uh, the we came uh, we left uh, was on the, the, the we left uh, on June the, the, the seventh or something. Like that. How did you make arrangements to come to Canada? Okay, how did I make arrangements to Canada? I had um, the, the the in the in the camp from the committee from the American uh, Jewish committee in the camp who was from Riga, they, they, uh, they tried to accommodate us because we were from Riga too, you know, to the so it was, uh, was a telegram or a, a, or a, or a thing what they, they, they ask for people, for uh, uh, tailors, they ask. Canada wanted tailors from Europe, so they, uh, they asked me if I want to go to Canada. So I says yes. So I went to I went to the committee and I said yes. So they sent me to a they sent me to was a, a compound they call it the Funkazene, where all the people who travel out from Munich to United States have to go there. There was a consulate there and everything was there set. And my wife at that time she was pregnant. She was uh, in the seventh month I think. And uh, we came to the consulate, everything was fine. I, I, uh, I had to make a test for tailoring that I know tailoring because uh, some people they uh, they said they were, they were a tailor and, and they, were, they were a businessman. They were no, no tailor at all. So they had to give me something to make, to prove that I'm a tailor. I, I passed the test and everything was fine. And, they, uh, and then I, we had to come back again to make a medical exam, med medical test and everything. And then uh, we got the permission that uh, we'll be able to go. So, uh, yeah. so what I did, I, I uh, liquidated everything from the what I had. You know, I give away whatever I had, whatever I could. I took it, and we had to go to the, the compound for the to the Funkazerne That was from there they took you to emigrate. That was the central consulate was there, and we came there. And uh, they said uh, that uh, they asked my wife how, uh, how how long is she pregnant? They said seven months. Seven months. They said we cannot go because seven months 
the baby can be both. And it's dangerous to go on the boat, and you can be born on the boat or on the way. It's very dangerous. I was so upset. That was my whole hope to get out from, from Germany, you know. And uh, my wife was upset too. And I uh, uh, talked to the consulate. I said, "What what I'm going to do now? It's it's very 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 unusual thing." He says, "Well, he says I'll promise you." says, you go back where you, to your compound, where you, to your camp, and when the baby will be born, he said, and will be six months old, you come to me. You see me, and I'll arrange it that you go. He gave me a written statement. A written, that was very beautiful for me, the consulate himself. He gave me a written statement. When I, the, kind, the kids will be born, six months old, straight to me. You come, I came, and I gave him the, 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 the letter what he gave me, and the, the boy Chico was six months old, thank God he was healthy, everything was fine, and uh, he says, okay, now we're gonna make arrangements for you to go. So where did you come in Canada? I came in Canada, we came in uh, Montreal, in Halifax. And from there? In Halifax we came, we stayed there a couple of nights, and uh, and uh, the tailors, when they came, was a few hundred of them. They came, but what they did, they didn't send everybody to to Toronto. They sent to Winnipeg. They sent to Vancouver. They said they sent uh, they sent in, um, in Montreal some and some to Toronto. My luck was in Toronto. So uh, and uh, one guy was before me there, and uh, he uh, they sent them to Winnipeg. And he didn't want to go because everybody here in Europe, Toronto, Canada, Winnipeg, who knows Winnipeg, you know? And it is true, Winnipeg is nothing there. Most the uh, community was here and the work, everything was here in Toronto. So they said, they said, you go, you go to Toronto, I was happy, you know? And uh, we came, we, ca we came uh, after uh, three days later, we came to Toronto. They give us, uh, put us on a train, and uh, they sent us to We came to Toronto, was, uh, the Union was on Cecil and Spadina, where Kensington Market is, right on the corner. There was a big building there, and there was the Union. And the Union brought us there, and they put us in, it was a big hall, and all the people, they prepared corned beef sandwiches, they prepared uh, food, they prepared drinks, and uh, they talked to us and they, they made us feel good and everything, you know, that uh, we are welcome and everything, every, everything will turn out good as long as we are here. Okay, fine, then uh, everything we finished, the, 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 the corn beef sandwiches and everything, and we uh, uh, finished everything all right. Uh, then the uh, people came, whoever came, who had family here, they came to that uh, uh, hall, to the union and to, to meet them, you know, and to take them to their places. But I didn't have no family, I didn't have nobody, the Congress brought me, I didn't have where to go. And I was sitting and sitting, and, I, and nobody come to say, you come to me, you know. What I mean? And then my, uh, it happened an accident that the baby lo uh, fell down the bottle on the floor. And, uh, the floor was a cement floor and uh, the bottle broke and he started to cry. So on the corner of the other side of the street, right on the corner was a Jewish drugstore, I forgot the name, a beautiful man. And uh, somebody went in there and bought a bottle and next door from the other side from the Union, from next door, the right away next door was a restaurant, a kosher Jewish milchike restaurant. And the guy uh, came in there and he asked to fill up, make a bottle for a baby. Ba the, baby the bottle was broken, the baby's crying. And, and, uh, and they fixed up the bottle. I don't know if it was a, was a little bit milk, whatever, but it wasn't the right formula for the baby because the, the it's not uh, you know, for a baby the formula. But anyways, it was good. He started to cry and everything. Then everything was okay. Then they said, uh, uh, the people who had family, they went away and we were a uh, few families, we were sitting, nobody came and they took us from the Congress, from the Jewish Congress, had our house on Cecil Street. It's Padina, 
Het is uh, een rijder kruis van Kensington. En they had a house there, a big house from 18 rooms, uh, three floors. And uh, people who came to Toronto and they didn't have no accommodations where to go, they, they accommodate them there uh, till they get something else. So I was, uh, they brought us there and they put us up on the attic. It was, was a small, a small room, but it was uh, not straight roof. It was, uh, uh, oh, you know what I mean, it's a pointy roof. And it was so hot there, it was in June. It was so hot, you could suffocate. And I didn't have nothing for the baby to, to make it, where to go, kitchen, a diaper, nothing. It was so, so terrible in Toronto. You know, in the, in the, in the, in the land of honey. And so I went down and uh, I went downstairs and I heard the baby was crying and I was sitting on the steps and it was on a Sunday, a Sunday afternoon, maybe around one o'clock, two o'clock. A guy, a Jewish man, came by an elderly man, I don't know, in the 70s. And he says he lives in the fourth house from the corner. You know, a small little house that looked like a new house. And he says, where are you coming from? I said, I'm coming from Latvia, Latvia, Latvia. He says, I'm not from Latvia. He says, you know what? He says, tonight there's a meeting in the Latvian Society in Toronto. And this is a Euclid and Dundas. I didn't know where you could have done this. I know now I'm just saying it straight, such a with an open with an open feeling. You could have done this. We came to the place, a small hall, and it was uh and uh, I said to my wife, I said, Well I'll go meet this man because maybe we'll get somewhere with this uh, maybe this thing he tries to help us. So uh, we went to the meeting there was about I don't know about 55 people, 60 people, something like this, men, women, elderly people, and was literally a Latvish society together, because literature wasn't enough, and the literature was very little, so they made a joint together, they call it literature, Latvish society. And uh, they, uh, they, uh, they asked me my name, I introduced myself, and they asked me to speak, you know, to give a, a short speech, how I got free, and how I I'm alive, and how uh, how did I went through? Where's my family, and whatever? And next to me was sitting a woman, and uh, an elderly woman, maybe 55 or something, 50, 55, maybe something like that. And uh, this woman was a rabbi's wife, and uh, I didn't know nothing. When the meeting finished, the gentleman took us home. He went up, took me to my place, and he went upstairs. And he went to his house. And the next morning, this lady who was sitting in the left side from me, she came to the house on, on uh, Cecil Street from the Congress House with a taxi. Listen to that. She came with a taxi, and she came up, and she I was just sitting outside the, with the baby that time exactly too and she says I have a place for you you want to come to us with the baby with the family the wife this was the rabbi's wife she was from Lithuania I says how can you do a thing like this you have room you have this and this you talk a Jew per perfect Yiddish you talk you know so I talk she says no problem he says Go in the taxi. She so came in the taxi, we took our bag, whatever we had there, and we came to her in the taxi and we went to her place. Her place was Robert and Blue. Mm -hmm. You know where Robert Street, Spadina Blue, Robert Blue? And Robert and Blue, there's a church on the corner, Robert and Blue. And next to that church was a small little house. The whole house was maybe 10 feet uh, wide and, uh, and 30 feet long. It's a very small little house, a wooden house. And she comes with the taxi and she opens the door and she comes in and she says, this is going to be your place as long as you wish. She took us upstairs, was a, prepared a room overnight. How could she do that? I don't know. She prepared, she, she, she had two children, one boy 17, a girl 14, and uh, that's all. And, uh, she hasn't got no much room there. Well, how can she keep us there? She made a, a one room, she made for the daughter, one room for the rabbi and the rabbitson, 
and the son slept on a couch downstairs. Anyway, she gave us the room. It was a small little room. It was so beautiful. It was, was so cozy. She, she was so nice, that rabbit, that woman. That was, uh, there is not a woman in the world, but I can tell you, she's 95 and we are still friends. What she's is her name? She's in Moises Canaan. It was Rivke Berenson. And she was remarried. Now she's, uh, her husband died uh, 20 years ago, the rabbi. And uh, she got remarried and she got a different name now. But she's in the Moises Canaan and we're visiting here. That was unbelievable, but I'll tell you a little bit later. So then she, she said she, she fixed up a bed for us and a bed, a, a crib for the baby. And uh, we started, you know, to, to, to loosen up and make yourself ready for the night. And she, uh, we, and she made our, our bottles, a couple of bottles. We bought our, she ran out, she bought a couple of bottles. And the daughter was so smart, and she uh, knew what to buy to, to make a formula. After this, did you start working? Yes. And where did you work? Okay. Well, after this, I they sent me the union sent me to work. It's very interesting, very important, and I hope that I'll be able to continue on this tape for you because this is historic. They sent me to work. The union phoned me up. They said they have a job for me, and this is named Popular Clock a ladies factory coat and this was on Dufferin and King a queen Dufferin and Queen you know where you go to the exhibition underneath the bridge there you go to the left you go to the exhibition that was about a half a block before that there is a, a was a, a restaurant called the, the 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 donut place I don't know what they call it the donut place so okay uh, so what what did you do? Where, where just a minute. So I went. Uh, so uh, they give me the place to go to work. They give me the address, everything, but I didn't have a penny. And I wouldn't go to the rabbits and say, rabbits, how can I go to work? I haven't got no money. I have to go on the streetcar. Okay. So I woke up five o'clock in the morning. And I walked to work. This was two hours walk. Walk two hours from Blue and Robert to Sunnyside, King, Queen, and, uh, and Duffer. I walked there, by the time I came there, I was tired, I couldn't walk already. I couldn't, it was hard for me to walk. And when I finished work, it was the same thing, I had to go back. And a ticket to go on the, on the streetcar was seven cents, four for a quarter. I didn't have this money, I didn't have nothing. And I was waiting till the first uh, check uh, I received was ten dollars and thirty cents. When I received this, uh, yeah, the Congress gave me a loan for ten dollars, and I and, and, and I before, and I had to manage that. But I didn't, I didn't want to spend on the tickets to go to work because I may, I might need something more important. So I walked to work. So the first check was ten dollars and thirty cents, and then I uh, started to improve myself, and I started to make a little bit more and more, and it was coming easier. Well, tell us about your family. The names of your children? My children, well, the, the, the oldest one is Joseph, and the second one is Julius, and the third one was Sheridan. Sheridan, uh, we didn't have much naches because he died about uh, s seven and a half years ago. Uh, in uh, He died in, it uh, was uh, May, May the 10th, he died. and. Uh, he was married for seven years. He didn't have no children. He was a wonderful, wonderful son. He had, he finished with honors. The diplomas is in the other, I'm sorry, the, the diplomas is in the other room on the wall. He finished uh, with all honors, 85, 85 from university and he, uh, in science and in, in, in computers. And a company was waiting for him to finish the job and they, uh, to finish the school, and he was already had a, he had a job. Wonderful, he was a brain. Okay. And, and uh, he died in 1987. And your grandson? And my grandson is, uh, oh, he's okay. He's 25. He's kind of a beautiful boy. And uh, he's, uh, he lives with his mother. They're divorced. The parents and he lives with the 
mother and he comes to visit us very often and he's wonderful and he loves us and we love him and, and it's uh, beautiful. So, in conclusion, to, to summarize your story, yes. how would you say these experiences have affected your life? What do you want to say to your ch children, to your grandson? Well, I would like to say this to my children, to my grandchildren, and to all the Jewish children that you never, never, ever got through in their life what I went through. It's not for you inhumane. And I hope for the rest of our all lives, forever, ever, and ever, the Jewish people should never go through things like this in their lifetime. Why did you want to tell your story today? Because it eased me up. My heart was full of tense. My heart was full of grievances. My heart was full of sorrow. I lost everybody. And more people lost who wished they would be here. And I had a stone on my heart, the weight of the globe. And with your presence doing this, you relieved me and I feel wonderful. May God bless you for all your kindness. But what you did, it's, it's unbelievable. There is no price to pay for your accomplishment what you accomplished for me. And I appreciate your coming. I appreciate your hard work. And thank you very much. And may God bless you forever. Amen. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. To my right is Mayor Simche Hatzadik, who I know when I was a small little boy. But I'm just sorry that I knew when he passed away. He was sick and he was in Switzerland for operation. I was a young kid to understand all this. But I know that he had operation there, how old he was there and what happened, I don't know. But I know he died in Switzerland. And, and uh, when they uh, macabre given him, they brought him back to Dvinsk, Latvia. The whole city, when they brought him back for the funeral, was on the rooftops of the city. You couldn't go in to, uh, through the streets. They carried him for six, seven miles to the cemetery. Was a, the cemetery was on a hilltop, very high, and they had to change the the pole bearers, they had to change it every so often because it was very, very high. Who, and it who was it? What, who was he or what did he do? He, he was, he was uh, the biggest rabbi in Latvia. He was a big tzaddik. He was known all, all over the world. And who is it, the other man in the picture? And the other rabbi is uh, the Ragatsover Gon. He he replaced Mayor Simcha Hatzadik, the one to my right. And his name was Dragatsova Gon. And personally, I, I saw him very, very often because uh, where we went to Shul on Shabbos, he lived not far from there. Him with the Shabbos, with the Shamas, used to go by. And I, I used to say good Shabbos to him. I was a little kid. And the sh uh, that rabbi, used to walk so beautiful with the beautiful black pom-pom pants and the white socks uh, up. You could see out the shiny leather leather shoes with the beautiful hat and the beautiful kittel that he was wearing was nice black silky, not a, not a crease in it. And the, and then with the, with the tie belt, it was so beautiful. When he was walking with the shamans on the street, it was a naches and an honor to see it. Thank you. 
this is me, Nissan Sis, a survivor from the Holocaust. I was freed from the Nazi occupation in uh, March the 10th, 1945. The picture was taken six months later because I only weighed 72, uh, 37 kilograms. I couldn't walk and I couldn't do anything and I couldn't sit. And this picture, I'm double the weight. And the number on the uniform is 96,254. That was my number when I came to the Camp Stutthof. And the writing on both sides of the picture is in memory of my family, entire family, my wife's family. And this was very, very enjoyable moment for me to see that I accomplished to memory in memory of my entire family. Thank you. This picture uh, shows for myself and my wife <coughs> when we got engaged that was taken in Munich, Germany in February 1947. Okay. <coughs> this is my son, Sheridan, born in 1952, May the 24th. I'm sorry to say that, that he is gone, he is not no more with us. He died in May the 10th, 1987. May his soul be rest in peace. This is <coughs> myself, my wife. We made a visit in Israel in 1969, in December. And that was a very happy occasion to see the victorious soldiers and our country freed by our own soldiers. And that was the time when my oldest son, Yosef, got married in, in uh, Petah. My name is Nissan Sis. To my left sits my lovely wife, Elena Sis, which we are married in 1947, 1947, with till 120. We're going to be married 49 years in February. We hope to reach the biggest the biggest occasion, the 50th anniversary with God blessing in good health and happiness and all the joy and naches from our children and the grandchildren. Mm -hmm.